Should we stand for the pledge? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the Little League pledge. <laughs> I've been doing that lately. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to start with the uh, approval of the agenda. All moved to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So, so approved. Any emergency modifications, Andy? There you go. Uh, approval of minutes. I'm abstaining. I was not here. Did we get the, uh, the change on the... Uh, yes, I, thank you. Uh, Jane helped us uh, identify that we had um, improperly identify... Uh, Shelley is having read two of the board resolutions. It was um, Thane who read the, the third resolution. Um, that's exactly. Yep. So we are going to uh, to make that modification. And with that modification, I'll move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, our student representative report. Okay. Hi, I'm Phoebe Dorn and Shepherd. CHS students will be touring CSUCI next Tuesday. They lost their graphic production teacher in December and are excited to have Alex Uvari come to teach graphic design at Chaparral. Matilda Hall is getting all geared up for state assessments, which this year will include the science test. They are also planning their last school dance of the year, not counting eighth grade promotion dance, scheduled for the 27th of April. On April 11th, Janine Murphy did an assembly on bullying through social studies class. They felt it was a good time to remind students of their expectations. Nordoff, we are preparing for our spring rally this Friday where we will honor spring sports and play team building games. Next week, we will have testing for junior and senior experience on Tuesday and Wednesday. Juniors will eat breakfast burritos, test, and go home around noon. Seniors will have time to bond, play games, reminisce, visit their elementary schools, take the panoramic pictures, and eat. Pancake, breakfast, burritos, and barbecue. The Summit K-2 through classroom planted seeds this week. They are studying plant animal life cycles using the second grade EEI unit cycle of life, which coordinates well with the second grade number corner activity of comparing growth rates for pea and corn plants. Students are asking questions to find out whether sunflower seeds grow better when planted with their shells on or off, since the class removed um, the shells while comparing chicken eggs and seeds. For these activities, the teacher mixes ages so K's don't feel lost and 2's can learn to be gentle guides. Students are also looking for seeds all around us in, in the food we eat and plan to plant more seeds as time goes by. Another very exciting activity for the class has been watching the live feed of the bald eagle cam on Santa Cruz Island. There are three chicks in the nest and it is so interesting to watch the parents feed the eaglets and watch them grow and change from one day to the next. The upper grade classroom took a field trip to Rincon State Beach with the Morito Foundation. Students participated in tide pool monitoring. The data was entered in the NOAA National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration database. At Topa Topa School, they are preparing for their upcoming open house and art auction. Come by on May 10th and see all the fabulous projects students have made and be a part of the excitement. On April 27th, Rotary Club will have um, lunch and plant a tree at the school. The kindergarten classes will be performing for the Rotarians as part of the luncheon for Arbor Day. On Monday, April 16th, the school site council will be meeting to discuss how to improve student attendance. A beautification day is coming up on Saturday, April 28th from 10 to 1. Grab your gardening gloves and come out and join us. A Place to Grow is currently enrolling for the 2018 to 2019 school year and only has a few openings left. Thursday, April 19th will be their 78th annual Dino Dig. Past years have had 100 families attending. We partner with the NFL to provide this community event for children ages zero to five. They will have the opportunity to dig up bones, create volcanoes, make their own fossils, and get dirty in the carpets. They have a new Miramonte beautification squad that was organized by a fourth grade student. They meet on Fridays during lunch recess every other week. The students make it a competition as to who collects the most trash by the end of the week. The group is supervised by a parent volunteer. Students participated in a three-week online readathon that ended last week. The students shop online through a readathon site to collect their prizes based on the amount of money they earn. After prizes and the fee charged by the company, Miramonte students earned $11,600.
These funds will be used to help with the PTO purchase of new playground equipment for both the kindergarten and grade one through six playgrounds. The top two fundraising students will be principal of the day. Since the school met the goal of $10,000, we will have a school-wide blue hair day. No, parents will be required to provide signed permissions for washout hair color to be applied at school. Parents also have the option of sending their child to school wearing a blue wig or a blue color. They will send home a permission slip allowing them to paint blue streaks in their hair of students who would rather have us add the color at school. David Walker, Miramonte parent and district employee, along with congregation members from the Ojai Valley Christian Fellowship, aka The Well, built the benches and installed them last week in the Garden of Knowledge in front of Miramonte School. Parent Shane Pruckup and his employees at Troop Art Manufacturing Ventura built the rock cages, aka as gabions that were used as the base of each bench. Now that the project is complete, plans are being made for the grand opening celebration. During the celebration, Casitas Water District and Ojai Women's Fund will be thanked for the grants that were provided. Volunteers who worked on the project and business that contributed to the materials will also be thanked. The board will be invited to this celebration. Our last family bingo night took place during food truck um, Friday last week. Once again, families and community members had a good time eating and playing. Our food truck event in June will include a free outdoor movie. Many OUSD staff members worked hard advertising the Young Americans program that took place last weekend. Approximately 80 students from our valley participated. The sponsoring Rotary Club received a donation from the Young Americans of $675 from that weekend. Plans are underway to schedule their return for next year. San Antonio. Mrs. Al Capine's first and second grade students are finishing their biography reports and will presenting their wax museum projects this Wednesday. Students are starting to memorize poetry from April's Poetry Month and they will be reciting their pro poems at Spring Showcase. Miss Spiva's fifth and sixth graders are visiting Poco Farms, helping to integrate our culture with NH NGSS Spring Science Standards. Sixth grade has been reading A Wrinkle in Time and had the opportunity to see it in theaters. The fifth and sixth graders studied influential and lesser known female heroines in history. Students wrote stories through their eyes. San Antonio students are busy studying the scientific method in preparation for the upcoming science fair. Miners Oaks, environmental studies. Each student from the class of Mrs. Duncan, Mrs. Wheelers, Mrs. Mays, and Ms. Terse met with Nordoff students from Ms. Jill Pine's environmental science class um, for a buddy science program, which I'm a big buddy for. Learning activities are usually held at Emma School or in the Ojai Meadow Preserve adjacent to our schools. Last week, Mrs. Duncan's fourth graders and Mrs. Wheeler's second graders had the amazing opportunity to walk to Poco Farm, which is only two blocks away from MO School, for an extra special buddy science program. NHS buddies taught MO little buddies about local plants and birds. Farmer Grace taught big and little buddies about goats, and all ages had the opportunity to hold and pet baby goats. Farmer Grace's mom, Allie, taught about organic cotton and dyes from um, local native plants. Big and Little Buddies got to dye their own organic cotton to take home. We feel so fortunate that we have an organic farm in the meadow preserve so close to our school and that we are close enough for NHS <coughs> students to walk over for this fun and educational partnership. Miners Oak Street Eats resumes tomorrow evening with the Tomato Mania. Tomato Mania is the world's largest and most fun heirloom tomato seedling sale with varieties such as chocolate stripes, Cherokee purple, and 4th of July available for sale. So in addition to the delicious food items and the food truck vendors, you can also buy tomatoes for your garden. The action begins at 5 p.m. at Miners Oak School. Be there for a deliciously fun time. Were you there the day the goats were born? Yeah. Were you? With my Red. daughter was there. Yeah. And, uh, are you guys in the same class? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. She did, you guys didn't get to see the goats being born, um, but you got to see <coughs> people eat placentas and fun stuff like that? Yeah, I think some people <laughs> lag behind. Did got to see them, and oh, then okay. some people were able to go back and see the like one minute old goats. Ah, well, very cool. Thanks, Susan. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Enjoy Another the place. rally on Friday. Oh, yeah. Public comments. Anyone like to speak? <laughs> if, you choose, if you change your mind, just let us know. Uh, special presentation on the later school uh, start time. Okay. So I have uh, several members uh, from the committee here tonight, so I wanted to introduce them. We have Gary Lang sitting here, a Nordoff parent. 
We have Annika Forrester in the back there, a Matillaha parent. Dave Munson was on the committee, uh, obviously parent as well as administrator. Carol Paquette uh, had children go through the district and also is an administrator at Matillaha. Um, Javier was not officially on the committee, but did participate. Was a sub. You were a <laughs> sub at times. For the record. For the record. <laughs> yes. <laughs> came from you know, a parent perspective as well as a student perspective growing up in the district and uh, as, of course, an administrator. And Jamie. a late sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I have no idea. <laughs> and then Jamie Rooney was also a member of the committee as an administrator from Nordoff. So they're here. Oh, I'm sorry. Teresa Dutter, you're back there, um, also was on the committee as well representing uh, as an administrator from elementary level. So. Our whole committee could not be behind, but we have many representatives, including Shelley Griffin, who was also on the committee as a parent and board member, and then, of course, myself. So um, what I would like to do is just kind of first walk us through the work that the committee did, um, and they're here to obviously provide extra comment and answer any questions that you have. Um, so this topic uh, did come to us at a meeting here. We knew that the state of California had a Senate bill, uh, SB 328, where the state was looking at potentially a bill that would mandate that all middle schools and high schools start 8.30 or after in the state of California. Uh, we know that that bill did not pass, but uh, you all wanted us to form a committee here and look at the issue and make a recommendation to all of you. I would like to say that it's actually back on. Oh, is again. it? it is. Right. So. Okay, so we will be tracking it. Have an opinion, write your, <laughs> write your, write your representative. Right. Um, so our committee met five times starting in October and then ending in February. Um, we started with uh, just sharing preliminary initial thoughts as far as where we all were on the topic. And then we started to look at the literature. And uh, the literature... <coughs> Really, you can find articles and information for both sides of the art, both sides of the argument. And I picked two titles here because I, I think it kind of illustrates my point. For example, one article is titled "Later Start Time for Teens Improves Grades, Mood, and Safety," and then the next article, the title is "Later School Start Time Not the Solution for Tired Teens." And that really is when you Google this topic, there is a whole lot of information out there and the opinions are, are extremely varied. So we did look at a lot of those uh, pieces of information in those articles, as well as some research. Um, uh, the most thorough study that we looked at was done by Dr. Kyla Wallstrom and her team. Um, it was titled, Examining the Impact of Later High School Start Times on the Health and Academic Performance of High School Students, a multi-site study. They looked at uh, eight different high schools uh, who changed their start time and the effect that it had. Um, as an example, one of the high schools that they highlighted in their study, it was Jackson Hole High School, they changed their start time by an hour and a half. So they had a 725 start, it changed to 855. Um, with that hour and a half change, what they saw at Jackson Hole High School um, was that <coughs> on average students were getting 42 minutes more of sleep. So um, Part of the problem, though, that we saw with the data is, for example, the other seven high schools, there was no pre-start time change data on sleep. And so uh, what you're going to find as we talk a little bit is we did see in the data sometimes that it was a little bit inconclusive uh, as far as really looking at, you know, all the, the different schools and their data. So um, another part of her research that you know any good researcher mentions are the other variables and these other variables I think really became the true debate of our uh, discussions. Um, she mentioned in her study that sleep can be affected by technology use especially in the evening hours because light exposure does affect sleep so daytime light exposure but also artificial light exposure as you're getting into your evening hours. She also mentioned how caffeine can affect that. Uh, the sleep as well. So, um, and those variables were really not looked at in her study so much, but they certainly were the, the topic of a lot of our discussions. In addition to that, we talked also about, um, from some anecdotal information from our parents on the committee, um, that the amount of homework our students have and the number of projects that sometimes fall on the same days or at the end of the week, um, that those things are also sort of equal contributor contributors in the variables that affect our children being able to go to sleep 
um, in a timely manner and for their brains to be able to shut down and get, get to sleep. Cause we do know that there's information out there that says that the, child, the adolescent brain has a hard time shutting down. So to fall asleep at night. So we looked at all of these things. We also did surveys. We did um, a couple student surveys and a staff survey. Uh, one of the surveys uh, looked, uh, we had 677 responses from students in grades 7 through 12 from Nordoff and Natalha. Um, and this was actually very in interesting to me. Um, and we also saw this on our committee with our three students on our committee. They, they had very diverse opinions, which again came out of the survey data. 41% um, of those 677 students said that they would prefer an 8 a.m. start time or, or prior, 7.45. There were lots of different options. 17% chose 8.15, and, and that's kind of important because we really did talk a lot about the possibility of 8 and 8.15 being maybe reasonable uh, start times. Um, without too great of an effect, but then the problem that we saw is that we weren't sure if it would have a, a, a enough of an effect on improved sleep for them. So again, because remember, even in Jackson Hole, they had to increase by a whole hour and a half to even get a 42-minute average improvement in the sleep. And then uh, the students, 42% uh, of the students chose start times of 8.30 and after. So again, we're just seeing very diverse opinions among our students. Um, our, our Nordoff staff, we had some data from them, and we saw that 56% uh, of Nordoff staff was willing to consider an 8 a.m. start time. Um, they said yes or maybe to an 8 a.m. start time. Um, but then once it went to 8.15, 77% said no, that they were not in support of that. So that did matter to us, what our stakeholders had to say as far as their recommendations. And thank you, Susie Taylor, for joining us. We have another committee member who's walked into the room. So after looking at all of those pieces, uh, we, I asked all of the committee members to submit to me in writing for our fifth meeting at the time um, where their position was, what, what they would recommend as far as um, the, the start time. And you'll see that in the documentation that where everybody ended up, we really had nine committee members that were recommending that, that start time stay the same. Three of those nine liked the flexible options though. So, so keep the start time the same, but if you can add in some of the flexible options, they liked that. Two committee members liked an 810 start time with a certain model that we saw in some other schools. And then four committee members um, were somewhere between 815 and 830. And at, at that time, I really felt like that really wasn't consensus by any means, right? We still have a very split group in my opinion. Um, and so I asked everybody, how they were feeling. Obviously, our job is to bring research and data and surveys to the table and to convince each other, right? Where our job is to persuade each other as far as what we thought was the right decision for our students here in Ojai. And um, so we went around the table and asked, did anybody feel like there was more that we could bring to our committee, more information, more data, more surveys that we could bring to our committee in order to persuade one another? And it, it was unanimous as we went around the table that we really did not feel that there was much more that we could look at, that we had really exhausted the research and really had looked at everything. Um, so at that time, um, there was a, a discussion about, you know, the other variables are important, like good sleep hygiene, as we referred to it from some of the uh, studies we saw, um, and really the, the fact that you could do an educational campaign out to parents to encourage them to turn off the electronic devices early for their kids and to have them encourage uh, an environment in their households where you know we can get our adolescents brain brains to shut down sooner and be able to fall asleep sooner and so what we talked about is instead of something so drastic maybe what we should be doing is each site should be looking at other interventions that we could perhaps do instead of, and, and maybe even with a, a greater effect, because those things hadn't really been looked at in, in research. So at that time, um, we did have a unanimous agreement that our recommendation at this time to the board is that there be no start time mandate at this time, and that we turn this conversation over to the school sites, because sleep is very important. We do realize that if you look at the, the graph data on uh, the document here, we do see that 31% of our students are sleeping <coughs> seven hours or less. And so, you know, we we do want to address that. Sorry, we 59%. do. 
Well, 28% fell in a range where we sort of thought it was, uh, you know, nearly meeting. But certainly you're right. If you had 28 and 31% together, then, you know, it's even more compelling that our students need oh, help. I'm sorry. I was looking at your chart here. So 59, there's a, I don't know if you can see it as well in this, but it's supposed to be green, yellow, and red. Mm -hmm. And so okay. it kind of breaks down that way. 41% okay. of students get eight or more hours of sleep. 28% are right on that cusp of seven or eight hours of sleep, and then 31% are getting less than seven hours of sleep. So uh, I think we're all in agreement that we would love to help our students address their sleep deprivation issues because we do see that it ties into their health and wellness. Um, however, again, what we're recommending is that this conversation gets turned over to school sites and that school sites do some of the things as we said in our recommendation, like do an educational campaign out to parents uh, talking to them about good sleep hygiene, what it means to turn off the electronic devices at night, what it means to, um, you know, get exposure to good sunlight during the day so that you actually can be with the circadian rhythm and shut down when, when the nighttime falls. Um, we do see a need for perhaps to do more surveys in the, in the idea that it would be nice to track what students say each year for how much sleep they're getting. That in and of itself brings awareness to the issue, but then also it's a good way for us to track if any of these interventions that we're doing uh, are working. Um, we did uh, agree that there should be conversation about the nightly obligations that students have and the amount of homework that they have, uh, that sort of thing, because if we can find ways to mitigate that, uh, we can um, potentially help our students go to bed earlier. Um, and then, of course, there are several options here, like looking at potentially flexible uh, schedules where kids have options and then you know simply potentially uh, just those one day a week where we have the early outs a late start could be a possibility so that summarizes where our committee ended up and uh, do you guys have any questions or I don't know if any of our members would like to add commentary I just would like to say that I think that part of the, the potential for other surveys is we only have 667 students responded from both schools. That's not just NORDOC, mm -hmm. which um, we don't know who the kids are that didn't respond. What, what are the numbers of all, all so the junior high and high school? Uh, about 1150, if you include Chaparral as well. So we're really not understanding the whole group. We're understanding those who would offer us their Agreed, although certainly 677 responses is statistically significant that we should be able to see trends from it, but I would love to see everybody respond. I think that would be a great way to fully determine where our students are falling. Yeah. This was an uh, anonymous study. Mm -hmm. Yes. I do wonder, I mean, I, you know, I just noted here, we have one student who purports to sleep one hour a night. <laughs> we have you two students who purport student. to, but, but really though, I mean, I wonder if we should continue that process and try to identify students that are, I mean, if, if this is to be believed, we have 20 students getting four or less hours of sleep a night. It seems like we probably should try and pursue that and find out who they are and what's going on with them. I, exactly, and I think that's exactly where we saw the solution to the problem is doing things like that, like turning this over to the site and letting them do those sorts of things. I think that, I think part of it is we think that actually might have a greater impact than simply just changing start time by 30 minutes or 15 minutes. Can I, can I speak to that point, Kevin? Yeah. Sure. Um, I was the particularly OCD individual on the committee that actually looked at every single cell in it, but not, not <coughs> the spreadsheet. Out of this, so it was kind of common because I'm trying to translate because I I converted a lot of the data. It was in um, like those Likert ratings. It wasn't a Likert rating. It was much sometimes and not at all. Mm -hmm. So I had to convert those to numbers and you know things like that. But um, so yeah, there were some small percentage of answers that were clearly um, the kids were just playing it. Right, they were right. just filling in silly answers for the sake of filling in silly answers. So yeah, we'll never really know if that's true. If that one kid that said he only got one hour of sleep is true. Okay, because I, I was also going to say for yeah. the kid who sleeps 12 hours, we've got to make sure we have stand-up comedy curriculum for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I still think that the data as a aggregate is probably pretty, you know, pretty reasonable given we have nothing else to compare it to. It's mm -hmm. a starting point. Right. 
But I mean, we presumably do have kids who are really, really sleep deprived. I mean, yeah. and that's, that's a yeah. separate track, right? You know, not having to do with how early we're starting school, but just. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, that is the key issue. We have kids that are sleep deprived. We know that that potentially correlates to mood and depression and so many other things. So we definitely want to address that issue. The question that the committee ended up grappling with is how to best do that. Mm -hmm. Is start time the way to do that? And we weren't convinced from the data that we looked at that it was conclusive that changing the time alone would, would change that or have the biggest impact. So the survey, did the survey ask how many hours they sleep or what time they go to bed and get up? I think that particular yeah, question, both. right, were there were a lot of questions, yeah. but that it, question it, asked. It, there were two separate questions. One was, <coughs> what time did you go to bed last night? What time did you get up this morning? Right. And so I had to convert and do a bunch of tricky math to get Excel to subtract, right. which, you know, was crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there was another question, which was something like, how much sleep do you think you normally get on most nights? It would sort of just give an estimate. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of interesting that those pretty much did line up. I mean, aggregate, again, the mm -hmm. average, if I took the actual self-reported last night's amount of sleep compared <coughs> to what they reported as what they think they mostly get, I mean, now plus or minus, not much. Mm -hmm. You know, I mm -hmm. don't think that was a very significant difference. So I was thinking, like, that's a little way to validate, right. you know, how much truth there is to these responses. Right. Um, and they were pretty close. Was there any clustering around the sleep time in terms of any commonalities? Um, I tried to, can I? Yeah. You're more than welcome to speak. Please speak. <laughs> <I'll stand laughs> yes. Um, <coughs> and I'm not sure what you're looking at because I did an initial kind of, that first one pager was like my first crunch of data, mm -hmm. but then I got all the rest of the data and I did a bunch more crunch of data and I shared it back with the committee. Um, I got kind of fixated, I sort of left the question of later start times, and I got kind of fixated on what are these kids telling us? Because we asked a whole bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, caffeine intake, sodas, energy drinks, um, TV, like what do you do? How do you spend your time after school? Before so that you go was to on bed? the survey? That was a on whole the bunch of stuff. That which was my big question. I've heard a lot from kids. <laughs> it's it's so really hard to wrap our arms around me. all that. Mostly because I think the, the design of the questions, I like, I couldn't even, when they, because we do have, in, they did answer a question like, what do you spend every hour of the day doing between when you leave school and when you go to sleep? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't manage how to make sense of that because my limitations with Excel and it's sort. But, you know, for a future survey design, we could probably do that better mm -hmm. in a way that we could pull out more meaningful data. The stuff I started to <coughs> slice and dice was just correlations between, and by the way, to your numbers question, Shelley, it seemed like we didn't get all the ninth graders. Because mm -hmm. I did somewhere slice out by grade, and it seemed like there was a, for some reason, all the ninth graders may not oh, have participated. That's interesting, because I think I asked my daughter if she did, and she's like, mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a really low number of ninth graders. I don't know what that's they attributed to. That week. Yeah, but. Um, some of the interesting things that jumped out, for me, like the one that yelled at me the loudest was we asked a question about kids to self-evaluate, self-assess their health. How do you, what, how, you know, what was the question? How was it worded? Like, I don't know if I can remember. Um, I think it's like, do you think you're in good health? Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you basically, how do you assess your health? Excellent compared to others your age. Excellent, good, or maybe there are four raters fair and poor. And I was really shocked that, where's the number on that? Um, a, a remarkably high percentage of kids did not assess themselves as being in good health. <laughs> and yeah, I was yes. like, oh, these are teenagers. If you're not in good health, when will you be? So that was shocking to me. Where's the number? Um, I don't have your breakdown in front of me, yeah. but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Here we go. Students who regarded themselves in poor health, we're nearly four times as likely to report feeling depressed much of the time. Uh, um, anyway, so, so some of these things, I mean, I can just tell you, uh, students who slept less than six hours reported three times the rate of feeling depressed much of the time. Mm -hmm. So the kids who slept less than six hours, 35% of the kids who slept less than six hours reported feeling depressed much of the time. 
which is three times more than the, the average. Mm -hmm. If my, I mean, except my um, not statistically significant analysis. <laughs> um, students who reported low GPAs were twice as likely to feel depressed much of the time. You know, so these are chicken and the egg things, I think. Sure. Right? Yep. But there were a lot of correlations between low sleep and poor outcomes, whether it's grades or self-assessment of health or mm -hmm. um, self-assessment of mood. Mm -hmm. There were definite there correlations. Were, I, was, I, I was surprised by the number of kids who reported not only that they weren't physically healthy, but mentally also. It seemed like the depression, we asked a question yeah. about depression. that. The most stressed students got one hour and nine minutes less sleep and rated themselves a half a grade point lower. That is, they, they self-reported their grades um, and rated their health 1.14 points lower than the unstressed counterparts. So, so there are definitely trends. But mm -hmm. again, you know, our method uh, is not publishable in a peer-reviewed <laughs> journal. But it's a start, you know? It, it, it is was, a start. It was really interesting. And, and I, I think it's valuable data because so as just a member absolutely. of my committee, my short answer is no, we, we, we are not asking the board to change the start time. Not because a whole bunch of us didn't think it might be a nice thing to do or a positive thing to do. It was mostly, in my opinion, it was because it was just unworkable. It was unworkable given the Rube Goldberg of everything that articulates with everything else in the district, from buses to PE teachers or coaches, right? It was just unworkable. But it wasn't because we didn't think that it might have some value. It was just, it wasn't worth the cost of disruption. <laughs> I think the cost of disruption can be big, although I really do think that our conversation ended up really balancing <coughs> the difference amongst the variables and whether or not some of these other variables would be the starting point for change, right? right? Because educating, doing an educational outreach is a very easy way to potentially affect change. And because we now have the starting point of all this great data, now we can look at does something simple like that have, it could have a greater effect than a later start but, team. But absolutely, to Kevin's point, like my thinking is like, so how can we target the most at risk? If there are kids who are telling us that I'm depressed all the time, I'm stressed all the time, and yeah. I am really worried so mm -hmm. much that I can't sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, how do we, you know, do that 80-20 rule? Put 80% of our effort in those 20% of our students or something like that. Right. Um, <coughs> and I don't have an answer, but I, I left this exercise going, oh, wow, we uncovered a stone here. And so I backed up and felt like this whole exercise was much more about student wellness. Right overall and start time would be a strategy to maybe address student wellness but 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 to me it's a bigger picture thing and I think it's really interesting that we're segueing into the suicide prevention conversation because I think that they're all you know potentially right. related yeah, they are. but there is more data if you want to geek out at this minutia <laughs> we really appreciate you, you sharing know. all that do you guys have questions based on that or I don't know. I just have one thing. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add that <clears throat> after coming up to the podium, if you do have comments, just so we can make sure the video picks up the. Just really briefly, um, after sitting on the committee and hearing in both sides and absorbing all the data, I really walked away with um, wanting to convey to the board that I th I think that it's really important to empower our local administrators, and that if they do have students that are reporting that they're getting four hours less of, of sleep or that they're struggling or that they're depressed or they're whatever their problem is I think that <clears throat> it can be handled um, by those local administrators and that we and that as a board I just I want to impress upon you the power of support that you can offer those local administrators because they can switch schedules around um, maybe they start at a, a second period and first period is you know we, we talked about different models but that those are individualized because those aren't the majority of our students. They were, were a, maybe a specific group of students that needed more attention. And I just think that our administrators know who those students are and with the right um, resources, they can address those issues. Well, yeah, I'll, I will say as one board member, I'm all, all in favor of that. I think that's great. Gary, did you want to say something? Uh, well, yeah. You know, just in, in, in I'm, I'm a parent, and I'm just thinking about the way we um, sort of frame the conversation.
talking about uh, coffee or, or whatever kinds of power drinks it's a lot of kids must, must drink, which inhibit going to bed earlier, but not all kids do that. And we didn't talk a little bit about the research that told us that teenage brains, for a brief period in their evolution, don't shut down early, and they don't wake up early, and they need some specific consideration. And I think it's worth the effort to, to uh, consider that. That's all I had to say. Gary, what do, what do, you, what do you think um, would be a way that, that a school, a given school, could accommodate that? I don't know. I know it's, I know, I, we, we, you know, I, I, we, I was participating in all the meetings, and I can see there's a lot of moving parts, but I think it's critical and um, uh, humane to address it seriously. Because if you have kids who don't like going to school, or they're depressed, we're sort of missing the point. The point is to have healthy kids with healthy attitudes, bringing positive energy into the community. Otherwise, what are we doing? I don't know the answer. And did you feel that that was, that later start times would contribute to? to More sleep would. Yeah. Yeah, I was an 8.30 guy. Because, I mean, I have kids and uh, I, see, I see that they're not awake. They're not there. I think they'd do better if they slept longer. I'm sure of it, based on what I've learned, you know. I think it's worth the effort to work it out. But I mean, you know, I'm not, I, I don't understand the, the mechanism. I'm just a parent <coughs> trying to uh, sort of uh, look out for the kids. Mm -hmm. you know. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I have one question. Um, this is, this survey sounds a lot like a climate survey, student climate survey. Do we do anything like that on a regular basis? or is we do. We have the Healthy Kids Survey, the California Healthy Kids Survey, but that didn't actually address our question. So we actually pretty much took the question straight from the survey that we saw uh, Wallstrom do. And so we, we had to pare it down because it was pretty long and we were concerned that our students wouldn't be able to answer all the questions very well. They'd get fatigued from it. So we pared it down, but we, we pretty much chose the questions from that survey. And that is where there may need to be some tweaking in the future because not all the questions, the data, when, you, when you're on the other side of the data and you're looking at it and trying to analyze it, we realize some of it wasn't that easy to analyze. So uh, you would certainly over time want to uh, adjust for the, those sorts of things and make sure you have questions on it that you can then easily extrapolate data from. It does seem like valuable data over and above the number of hours. It is definitely valuable data, and I do think that obviously it's one of the suggestions to do regular sleep surveys <coughs> so that we can track this and pay attention to it. That, that is the key point of all of this is to make sure that we are helping our kids get more sleep. Sleep and health and wellness. Right. Did you, in the course of gathering info, did you, did you um, find information where like a given administrator at a different school, at a given school was able to help craft more individualized sort of solutions to individualized issues, you know, I mean, I, because I, Greg, Gary, I completely agree, and I think actually it's one of the things that we can potentially do in Ojai mm -hmm. that other districts can't because we're small. There were absolutely schedules, for example, that were flexible, and that is one of the recommendations to bring back to the site. There's, especially like we talked about, for our students who play sports, they're technically in seven periods. There might be an opportunity there to allow kids who are in a seventh period to drop their first period and sleep in later. So those are all things that we don't need to, again, sort of as our recommendation ended, we don't need to mandate it at this level. That's something that sites can look at and it can be uh, determined individually by students. The other thing is, you know, when you look at the amount of homework <laughs> a student has, if that's the thing that's getting in the way of them being able to fall asleep a little bit earlier, then maybe we give that student a study skills class during the day and, and they get some of their homework done at school or you find some way to accommodate that. So that's, that's where we see that the solutions to the problem of sleep deprivation, and it ties, sleep deprivation goes hand in hand with the health and wellness issues. We see that there are so many potential solutions, it's hard to know which one's gonna be the key solution. So that is where we're turning it back to sites and saying, you know, here are all the things that we think would help this problem. You know, now do with it what you will. Or what you can, right? What what in terms of like how how would like how would the process go? I mean, I don't you know, every, no, and just in terms of so, you know, I, my kids went to Patrick, mm -hmm. and I know how much homework they did. Mm -hmm. And then I would run into friends of kids who were at Villanova or kids who were at Nordoff, and da da da. And Nordoff kids tell me they have 
more homework than my kids were experiencing. Mm -hmm. So if that if we did a survey, I don't know if that was part of the survey. What happens? I mean, I, I know a teacher kind of feels like, well, I got to get through this by the end of the year, mm -hmm. so I need to get, you know, so how do we, how would the process, and maybe we don't have an answer right now, but if we said, look, part of this is we're, we think maybe we're assigning too much homework, mm -hmm. or we think maybe, I don't know, whatever else you think of from the data, mm -hmm. how would that process begin to change? I, I see the role best being played out in the form of some sort of committee on the campus. Like, I'll think back to Janine uh, helping us out at Topa my first year there for a bullying prevention. Um, we had a bullying prevention <coughs> committee. And in that committee, we discussed things. We looked at data, we looked at information, we looked specifically at curriculum, and we talked about, okay, what do we need to do on this campus to implement some of these things? So I see the same sort of model happening at Matillaha and Nordoff and even Chaparral, a committee of parents and students and administrators looking at the issue, talking about what they want to try, um, bringing it to the faculty then and letting them know here's what the committee is recommending, trying something out and then collecting data on it. And certainly surveys on a regular basis would be part of the process and then that committee would revisit it. So I, I think that a committee at each school site would be uh, the best way to approach. Because uh, you have to address it in an ongoing manner, right? It's not something you're gonna address one time and be done. It's really not, especially because it's likely to evolve, right? The issues and the problems. So that's how I see it functioning on a school site. We'd really like the magic wand, though. I love <laughs> the magic, magic wand, too. Wand that's, I don't like it? complex yeah. problems. I like it when there's a wrong choice and a right choice and we can just make it. Yeah. I actually, I, I appreciate the work that this committee did. Obviously, they did a lot, a lot of work. Again, I don't know what we do to our committee people. <laughs> well, and we threw just, a fire and a flood in it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just to you know, keep it interesting. Um, I'm always a little leery of you know broad brush, one size fits all solutions because they rarely do. Um, so I like the idea that you want to get down granular and deal with it on a much more local, multi-faceted level. Um, what I would like is a report back mm -hmm. about what has been considered and what was implemented so that we, as a board, know what's going on out there mm -hmm. um, and can understand how much progress is being made in case if we don't decide to do something tonight, we might change our mind at some future date. Because mm -hmm. it seems to me this is the beginning. Yeah, I agree. It's absolutely the beginning. And I think we can report back to you on the types of things that we're doing on our sites. That would be helpful. Because I do, you know, um, Michael, I, I tend to lean very heavily towards Gary's point of view, which is, you know, just because something's difficult and change is hard and people don't, you know, doesn't mean it's not something that needs to be done. So um, I, I understand that, you know, maybe it, maybe there isn't enough evidence that changing the start time improves grades or improves uh, what all this other stuff but i have to agree with the science of the adolescent brain and we we know that i mean i don't think there's ever been an argument that the, oh no the adolescent brain doesn't do that you know so i i hope it you know maybe if we don't act now that it it stays on a warmer and not put in the garage. Well, that's why I'd like to see regular yeah. reports. Because so for me, I, I would say it's worth it's worth the difficulty of changing a bus schedule or changing a school schedule or finding, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the science of the brain is pretty set. And so for me, it would disturb me that we would not make a choice because it's too hard to make a, a change. I don't think I would say not to do it because it's too hard. I think I would say you, you, you ramp up, right? And if there are a number of other potential, there are, there are a lot of ways of addressing this, right? And start time is one. But if, if kids still stay up later and still use a lot of blue light at night and all those other things, then the problem isn't necessarily gonna go away. Um, and I see that there's a high percentage, actually. I mean, 40% or more that are getting eight hours, eight plus hours, surprises me. Um, I never did. Um, <laughs> So that's a fairly high percentage, not high enough. Um, but I, I'm, I don't know, I'm inclined to see how do some of these other um, approaches help first, and then if, it's, if we're not getting the bump that we need, 
I'm perfectly open to a wholesale change of start time. Um, I'm just, when there are other things, uh, it's like I kind of want to see how that works. That's, that's kind of where I'm inclined first. So. I think it'd be unfair of the, some of the committee members if I didn't comment on the science on the brain. I think that um, there is controversy there and there is disagreement there. So while there is some science that the adolescent brain has a hard time shutting down at night, <coughs> there are professional people out there and people in our committee that brought it to the table that it is potentially the artificial light and other factors like caffeine intake and sugar intake and all sorts of things that might be contributing to their lack of ability for their brain to shut down. So um, there's controversy out there. Yes, there's data, and that's the problem with data, right? That's the problem with research. You can cherry pick it to prove your argument, but that's what made it hard for us to be compelled one way or the other is that there's so much controversial data out there on it. So I wanted to mention that. I'll say, I, I think my interest is more drawn to the specific than the general, you know, so that in, in, a, in, co in contrast to you, Michael, I, I, don't, I don't feel like the result of the study is such that the board would be in a position to impose a different start time because I frankly take the result of the committee as being inconclusive on that. But, but I think you know, as Annika was saying, and in, in, in Gary, the, what you do see are that there are kids really struggling. Yeah. And one of the things, I mean, I, all of us who are parents, you know, we always struggle with that thing where it's like, well, it's too bad, you know, you, you, this is the bed, you, you, you're going to sleep in the bed you made. But, you know, that goes only so far. At some points, you just have to recognize that something's going on and you have to do something about it mm -hmm. that accommodates the kid. And so I'm very much in favor of, of doing that when we can. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully you and Andy are sending the message to all the you know, administration that those kinds of things can and should happen. That's why they're here. Michael, you mentioned about having some reports about what's going on, and I can already tell you we've taken some steps to do some parental outreach in our um, spring newsletter. You know, we put out some tips to parents about how to uh, help them get the kids to sleep at night, uh, gave them six tips, and, and involved with that was the caffeine, it was the uh, artificial light, the cell phones in particular. Uh, I also mentioned um, trying to cool the room at night. Um, also <coughs> incorporate maybe some high carb diets you know to help them fall asleep so we've done some educational outreach uh, what we're also doing right now is working on uh, a survey to shift our finals week so that we're starting later in the morning um, as one way of looking at you know this without making that wholesale change so I want you to know that things are already in progress and we're working on that you know Kevin when you mentioned you know about the individuals you know what we can do to accommodate that we've been doing that for years when we look at our scheduling you know while we may be limited in our master schedule you know due to our small size and you know our singleton classes you know we always look at the individual students when we have schedule requests so um, you know, even though we do operate on a macro level, we are always concerned on the micro level. And, and we do have students that, you know, have five day, uh, excuse me, five period days. We have some seniors, in fact, who have four periods a day. So we have those options built in. But as far as making it more of, uh, you know, kind of a broad scale global um, schedule that accommodates that on a much larger level, that's difficult to do, um, you know, given our limited resources. And the point you just brought up is I was, I get, you know, in, in fairness, uh, I know one of the downsides to being small is also, as you said, singleton classes, and yeah. you just don't have multiple options for kids. So if the kid has to take that AP, AP class, that's, that's it. That's the class. Correct. Um, do, you, do you think that there's a, is, is there more of an opportunity or is there an available opportunity to use that first period for is in a more flexible way or do you just feel like it's kind of being done already that way you know in terms of maybe some kids who really have issues with just not morning people being able to somehow structure a, <coughs> a schedule that where they could start later well um, in speaking with uh, my counselors recently because we are in the heart of master scheduling yeah. season you know and being the first time for me through this process from um, 
you know, my position is that, yes, we, you know, we do take that in consideration, but is there something else that we can do? And I found out, you know, what we have is some students who are on the opposite end where they want to start early. So these are the zero period students that have jobs in the afternoon. Um, they also prefer their morning people, and so they like to be done with their school earlier. You know, an option within our registration process is to have an option for kids to ask for, instead of a period six off campus, a period one, um, where they're, in a sense, kind of shifting their schedule, to have that more of a request rather than the request that's made after registration has already taken place. And so in that way, we may be able to get a sense of, you know, what kind of trend that we're looking at in terms of numbers, you know, how many students are looking for a later start time, um, knowing, you know, there's trade-offs in, in every type of schedule. So I think there's still things that we can work towards and improve. Absolutely. That's great. I would love that advice to get its way to the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's already happening. Um, and also, we have a lot of students at Nordoff who, who want the seven classes. I mean, they, right. they're, they they're the so problem. happy that they can right. take that's right. the right. extra. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe I, I think I know I speak for the whole board. And, and, and I, to every administrator and teacher out there who hears us up here saying things that are just like, yeah, buddy. <laughs> you know, it's not that easy. We're sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what, what else can we say? You know, they're just, it, it is very, very often true that we think of things up here that you guys are already doing or, and please don't hold it against us. You know, we, we, we just <laughs> no. do our best just like you guys, but um, totally appreciate you know what, what you're already doing and I know the board recognize the fact that you know we're not just administrators you know we have kids too and so we're living that part of it as well and you know I want um, be able to stand up here and say hey it's easy to do these things you know have the cell phone taken away at night and not be in the room and not have caffeine uh, that's not easy to do it's it's hard and as a parent you know we have to work really hard at it with our teenagers too so <laughs> But I, I think that's also part of the solution. And it's something that as a parent that I have to fight the good fight, so to speak, because um, I think that plays uh, a role as well. To add to what Dave said, when we register students and they're registering for a five period day, they've never <coughs> asked for first period off. They always want six off. Like I've never had one oh, person ask for first period off. Hmm. Very interesting. And you know, hundreds. Of Thousands of requests for six period off <laughs> over the years. That is interesting. Yeah, I did first, first period when I was in high school. I'm like, give me that first period off. You want to know who asked me to start? Because I need that 12 hours. I need that 12 hours. It's not crazy. I think they're just thinking they're early release time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're not It'd be interesting, though, as we start talking about right, sleep right. and the importance if that starts yeah. to change. I mean, again, as you start yeah. tracking, it's like, Huh, so this year we had 20 kids ask for first period. We've never had that before or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. You know, as it becomes. Um, that was one of the things that kind of came out in the, or somebody mentioned in one of the studies was that they got more sleep, but some of the students commented that, well, now we know we're supposed to get more sleep. So <coughs> it was stated in the research yeah. that the awareness alone, the awareness helped, them alone make helped change sleep habits and, right. and could have contributed to why they were getting more sleep, not just the late start. Right. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we're on a good path, and yeah. as Jane said, let's keep it heating somewhere and not in the garage, and hear back from you in a while. Perfect. <clears throat> Thanks, for everyone, everyone, for being on that committee. Being here, it was a lot of effort. Yeah. So moving to <laughs> suicide prevention, another special presentation. Right, so as Annika said, the, the timing is, uh, um, is appropriate. You know, we have spent the last few months not necessarily always talking about new policies, but just really trying to highlight things that we're doing to ensure uh, our campuses are safe and, and for the overall wellness. Yeah, if anyone uh, on the committee would like to step out, feel free. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so the past few board meetings, we've had, you know, our safety plans came to the board uh, last month. We had uh, Chief Ryhoff here just last month. Uh, in February, we talked a bit as well uh, um, about overall campus safety. And obviously, we see this, uh, this suicide prevention policy as the overall <coughs> of, of student health and, and overall wellness and school culture. So 
Um, we did adopt a new policy in the fall, a uh, modification to the prior policy that we held. Um, we didn't have a chance to have that formal presentation in the fall, and so that's one reason that we're, uh, we're having it tonight as well. Um, but really, again, this is part of an overall theme that we're really focusing on uh, over these past few months of talking about um, how we really focus on the, the safety and well-being of all of our students. So uh, with that, we have uh, Janine Murphy, our mental health clinician, as well as uh, a <coughs> high school counselor, Carly <coughs> Kudrem. So they're going to give a, a presentation on the, the policy. So I know that sometimes when I come here, it's because we've had a new policy adapted. Um, but I have to say that in general, um, our district, in my opinion, is very progressive. And we have started doing stuff long before the policy or new policies are implemented. So um, suicide prevention is one of those. <coughs> and um, Carly and I work really closely together. So tonight, we're going to talk about three specific areas, prevention, intervention, and postvention. Um, and I, you know, let's see, 2006, I guess, when I started here. And then in 2012, we started our first SAFE Talk. So that stands for Suicide Awareness for Everyone. And we trained over 100 staff and parents that year. In 2014, we listened to what the students had to say about um, a lot of the vignettes that were in the SAFE Talk. So we also were training um, students as well. It's for high school on up. And they said, we want more vignettes that are applicable to us. And we listened to them. And so Living Works, which puts out Safe Talk, and um, Ventura County Office of Education, and Nordoff partnered. And we created vignettes that were um, for the Safe Talk program that had to do with adolescents and what they thought was important. So um, one of the vignettes had to do with um, being different, so touching a little bit on LGBTQ. And then the second one was on um, leadership and <coughs> what it was like to be in the band or in leadership and be ostracized and the feelings that can go along with that. Um, our own teachers and our own students starred in the vignette. So, you know, that is a start of it. Obviously, collaborating together, you guys heard the presentation beforehand about collaborating and having committees, and I always go back to what the students are saying. They give me um, the greatest ideas um, about suicide prevention um, and, or any topic, right, that they comes to their mind. Um, some of the other things that we do pre for prevention, um, besides training all of the um, secondary staff in 2016 for Safe Talk, is that this year, because of our new policy, um, it's not that we changed anything, but we did focus a little bit more on helping our staff figure out how to identify students that potentially um, were at risk for suicide. And so we did train all of our classified and secondary staff um, on those topics. In your um, handouts you have at the, um, one of them, it's, they're the loose ones. Um, recognizing and responding um, to warning signs for suicide, um, risk factors for youth suicide, um, protective factors for youth suicide, which I wanted to jump in there in the last um, talk and say, let's talk about you know um, what we can do to help these kids at home, which is bridging not from dependence to independence, but interdependence as they're moving through this transition um, through adolescence. Not just that we're sending them out on their own, but how can we continue to support them just like we do um, a toddler that is learning to walk. They run away from us, they come back and hug us, and then they run and they figure out their some independence, and then they come back and we're there to support them. And um, having trusting adults is one of those protective factors. Um, our teachers, um, our therapists, um, and obviously our school counselors, as well as anybody else that's on campus that is a trusting adult um, and their jobs and uh, elsewhere. So. Um, we do, of course, have the mental health program, and that's another preventative, um, but it also can fall under what we utilize as an intervention as well. Some of the other things we do for preventative measures is that um, Janine meets with the administrators and the counselors every year, and she reviews the uh, paperwork that you have with us, and like the flowchart that you saw that tells us what to do when we have a report of someone feeling suicidal. Um, the counselors and the administrators also go to every single social studies class and we introduce ourselves and you know by the time they're senior it's our fourth time but we remind them what we're there for that we're there to help them feel comfortable at school we're there to help them deal with anything that's hard for them um, to help them make them through the day at school 
Uh, we also have Girls Empowerment and Boys Integrity workshops, which Janine knows more about that than I do. Um, and we have training for staff, which Janine went over. We have our website. Um, we have senior siblings. I think you guys heard a little bit about that tonight, but they do things throughout the year where seniors and freshmen are paired up um, to make the transition more smooth from high school. And I can't think of anything else. You know, I think that the culture on campus yeah. generally um, is preventative in that we, you, when you walk around campus, you see adults saying hello, mm -hmm. even if you don't know the student. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that in and of itself is preventative because we're making eye contacts with mm -hmm. the students. Um, if there's somebody that I think I see sitting alone or mm -hmm. is... Um, I don't know, seems upset, I don't know, I go up to them and I ask them if they're doing okay or if there's anything I can do to help them. They probably find that a little annoying, but um, <laughs> I do that sometimes. Um, or if I've tracked a student from like the junior high to the high school, typically I can kind of see um, how their social interactions are with others. And if I notice a change, then I won't hesitate to talk with them. So I just think in general, we do have a preventative mm -hmm. culture um, on all the campuses mm -hmm. that I'm on. Can I ask you, Janine, just because yeah. we were talking about that, I remember, was it two or three years ago when Nick Vujovic was here, mm -hmm. and there was a, like a, suddenly like a, this uptick and people were like, oh yeah, I've been, right, I mean, were the, wasn't that, a feel, was that just depression or bullying? I mean, I mm -hmm. thought it was also like suicide, like it was like there was kids who were kind of crying and saying, yeah, I've thought about killing mm -hmm. myself. Am I... Is that not? There were at least a couple where that came up. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's so, just interesting whether that stayed with us mm -hmm. or that was like, okay, I forgot about that. It was 12 months ago. Well, and I think it's important in the way in which you speak to students about topics of suicide um, and give them understanding. So I'm a little bit more on the from the path of talking with them in smaller groups. Um, I like that's how come last week at Matillaha, instead of having this great big um, assembly, I met with each social studies class. I can look at them, I can see their, um, like how they're interacting, if, they, if somebody has shut down. So that's a little bit, because I think it can be overwhelming whether you're having thoughts of suicide or not. If you're just a caring person, I think that that kind of stuff can really bring up um, emotions for you that are pretty intense. And, um, if we don't have a good outlet for that or somebody watching them, um, we don't know, you know what their coping skills are like. So for me, I like a little bit more of the smaller. Um, in general, mm -hmm. what did we say, 20 to 30 times? Yeah, we, think, we think the amount of students who we have conversations with about suicide and having suicidal thoughts has been between 25 and 30 per year consistently for and some of those over and over years. again so it's yeah. not 20 to 30 individual students maybe mm -hmm. it's 15 students mm -hmm. but then the rest of the time we've had multiple conversations with them um, helping them identify healthy mm -hmm. coping skills yeah we don't and feel like the numbers change over the years yeah you, it's been consistent yeah consistent yeah absolutely is yeah. that thing they do in the freshman class now is that that health and wellness too or is that just college and career foundations that's yeah that's just career stuff it's not yeah i mean it kind of crosses over to the mm -hmm. whole person but more college and career and trade school and work they're still doing some self-assessment life right? planning yeah. right it's yeah. kind of it, yeah. so probably some discussion but yeah, yeah it's not the intent if somebody turned in a workbook and didn't have anything for future planning you know that would be a red flag for us mm -hmm. so, so um, you, you mentioned um, staff and faculty mm -hmm. are getting better at recognizing mm -hmm. the loners and all of that but in the context of the bystander culture kind of yes. thing, mm -hmm. have you seen, because in an ideal world, it would be one of the seniors who went up mm -hmm. to that person and said hello, or one of mm -hmm. their peers who came and checked, did the mm -hmm. check-in. Right. Are you seeing any increase in that kind of awareness? Well, most of the time when we get, um, when a student is identified as having potential um, thoughts of suicide, it's from another student. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I was thinking about that before I came, thinking you guys would ask, who tells me that someone's suicidal? So I think it's about a third of the time it's a close friend of the person. Um, and that could be that they had a conversation about it, but more likely it's on social media. Yeah, and the, the friend can see it. Um, and they trust us and they come tell us about their friend. About a third of the time it's an acquaintance that saw it on social media. So they may not even really know the person, but somehow they're friends and they can view whatever social media site they're on. And they say, we don't really know this person, we don't know if it's real, but here's what we saw. So about two-thirds of the time it's coming from a peer. And then I would say about a third of the time it's from a teacher because of something that happened in class. Um, 
from a writing or yeah a writing like something verbally topic. said um, and then infrequently it's a parent but it and so you know maybe two percent of the time it's a parent and it sounds like therefore very rarely is that person seeking out help themselves that can happen too. They do self-refer. Yeah, Absolutely. but it's more, so my statistics aren't perfect, right? <laughs> Maybe like 10% of the time it's the student themselves. Okay. Yeah. And I think there's still a stigma, obviously, with, about talking about mental health concerns. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, I know that we have I think students. there's less of a stigma or, than before, yes, though. Yes, there is still a stigma, but less mm -hmm. of a stigma from before. But we have students that we've helped that have kept in touch with us over the years that continue to tell us that we've helped them and um, how appreciative they are. So I think it's continuing to have a um, climate um, and culture on campus where we continue to feel comfortable talking about that and saying, I need help. Um, this does not make me weak. Mm -hmm. This does not um, mean that I'm not going to be able, I'm going to be dropped from my AP class, but I'm going through something right now that's overwhelming and I need some support. And, and so we're hoping to continue those conversations. And my thoughts on, um, on how we're finding out is that if, if a student puts it on social media and 200 of their acquaintances and friends see it, that it is their way of telling Although they're not like knocking on right. their teacher's door and telling them, they know that when they tell two hundred people that it's going to get back to an adult who cares about them. And, we and so don't I do tell. think they. That's self yeah, I think they know yeah. they're telling. Yeah, they're just telling in an indirect way that they feel comfortable with. And we don't tell the person who told us. We keep yeah. that confidential. Yeah, so I can tell you about a typical type or a, a day if um, someone was feeling suicidal. So it would start with me receiving the information. And again, I can get it from many sources, but it's usually a fellow student or a teacher. And um, the first thing I do is I look at what time it is. You know, if I only have one minute before the passing bell, I don't want that student to be alone. So I would immediately call the teacher, get a hold of the teacher and say, please keep this student after class, I'm coming to get them. Um, and, uh, but if I have like 10 minutes, then I have time to go to my neighbor, my counselor and neighbor, um, and say, you know, I have a student who's feeling suicidal. I'm going to go get them in class. I leave, I go to their class. While I'm leaving, um, the counselor gathers the paperwork that you guys have all reviewed that I will eventually go over with them and um, goes and tells an administrator what we're doing. I go get the student and as we, uh, and I tell them, I just hand a call slip to the teacher and then I leave. So it's like, because I, I don't want anyone to know that we're doing what we're doing. So I hand a call slip and then I stand outside the door kind of far away. Um, and then they come out, which would be like a normal meeting. We could be talking about college or a job. or. And then as we walk back, I just say that I heard they were having a hard day and I want to talk to them about it because I want to help them, but I want to wait till we get back to my office. So when we get back to my office, um, I then tell them that I had an anonymous report because we never give the name of the person who told us. Um, because we feel like we want to have people feel comfortable telling us and part of that is them being anonymous. Um, and honestly, you know, I do this 10 to 15 times a year. I've been a counselor for like 18 years in this district and I don't know why, but they always open up. And so, I mean, I think it's just the relationship. I walk by them and I smile at them. I say hi to them. You know, I think it's just that they trust me. And so I, they tell me what's going on in their life. We talk about today. How are they feeling today? What's going on today? We talk about last night. Because I find a lot of the times um, it's, you know, late at night that they're feeling really the most stress. So we talk a lot about last night, then we talk about last week, we talk about last month. Um, once I start understanding what they're going through and start to understand whether they have the ability to cope with what they're going through, um, I, and they already know they're called in because I heard that they were feeling suicidal. Um, but at that point, once I've kind of gathered all the information I do know and I'm understanding and I'm able to be empathetic about what they're going through, um, I then go and get another counselor and I tell them, Nordoff has a rule that when we talk about suicide, we have two adults in the room, um, which I love that rule. The rule makes me feel comfortable with the decision I make about whether the student is safe or not. And so um, I ask permission to go get the other counselor, but it could also be an administrator if a counselor is not available. It could be Janine, it could be our school psychologist. Um, and we invite them into the office. I ask permission to share everything that I've learned so far. 
and um, so that the person coming in kind of in the middle understands what's going on. And then we go to uh, immediately asking questions. So let me give you like a time frame. That might take like an hour, you know, or maybe like a half hour. So although I'm going through it really quick right now, um, the person will share a lot with me over a half hour or an hour. Um, we, recap, we recap for the counselor who came in, and then we, then we um, check to see if the person is suicidal. So we ask four questions. One, are you currently having thoughts of suicide? And you guys have all this paperwork. Two, have you thought about how you might take your life? Three, do you have a plan to kill yourself? And four, do you have access to weapons such as guns, knives, and prescription medicine? And I just want to interject because we do use those words. It is, mm -hmm. we, you guys were talking about myths and stuff. It is a myth that somebody will become suicidal because you use the word suicide. That is not true. We absolutely want to speak to them um, plainly and we don't say hurt yourself because maybe they're cutting, mm -hmm. which is separate from suicide. So we would actually ask them if they um, are having currently having thoughts of suicide and then if they have in the past and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So I just wanted to interject that because it is a myth that we, we don't use those words. And I find, I mean, I want to say 100% of students, but let's say 99, are very comfortable having this conversation by the time we're at this point. Um, they, I also find that no matter how they answer those questions, there's like a relief that an adult that they believe can help them get them help knows finally. And so I, I find that re, regardless of how the answers go, that there's a sense of relief, that they instantly feel better by telling someone how they're feeling. Um, because oftentimes it's a secret that they've kept until that moment that they shared it on social media. And even if they're not suicidal, something else is going on that's causing them stress, and so we can at least talk about that and address that concern. So obviously if they answer no to all those questions, then what I'm really doing is help them, helping them identify the coping skills that they already have, likely, to deal with what they're going through. Reminding them, I'm asking them, like, what do you do to make yourself feel better when you're not feeling good? And they say things like, I go for a hike and I hike the, the mountains and I get out of breath or I dance or I music. sing or I listen to music, you know? And so I'm just reminding them, these are the things that help you feel better when you don't feel well. Um, so if they say no to everything, we just, we put a safety plan together. They, they write a contract, they fill in a contract that um, they promise not to harm themselves. But remember, they've already told me they're not gonna harm themselves. So that's like an easy commitment for them to make when they say no to the questions. They identify three coping skills that work really well for them. They identify three people that they feel comfortable talking to. Um, I make sure that one of them is an adult. So maybe I make them do five. If they list three friends, I say, oh, how old's that person? <laughs> you know, how often do you get to talk to them? You know, so I, I make sure they have access to the person. I make sure one's an adult on campus. It could be me. It could be Janine. It could be one of their teachers. Um, and oftentimes they'll list the counselor at this point because we've just had this moment where they um, know that I will help them. And then I make sure they have one adult listed outside of school if, if school's out of session. So it could be an aunt, an uncle, a mom, a dad, but I make sure that they have an adult listed outside of school too. Um, and then we, um, at this point, we call parents. So, and the student, we hope the parent will come to us and sit with us and talk about what the student just told me was hard for them, what's causing them stress. Um, what their coping skills are, making sure that they remember what their coping skills are, who they trust to talk to, giving them access to those people. Um, and I would say 95% of the time the parent drives wide over and we have a great conversation and the student feels a lot of relief that the parent knows what's going on in their life, that they were feeling suicidal and that they put it you know, on social media or told a friend, um, and that their parent is now going to get them help, which is usually we give an outside referral list or we offer them um, therapy on our campus. And so the ball gets rolling to help them develop more coping skills to deal with how they're feeling. And they usually are very happy that we help them um, tell their parents and uh, get through that hard moment. That's their biggest source. I think we're all good until we say, okay, now it's time to call the parents. And then there's that initial anxiety again of mm -hmm. what's going to happen, how are they going to respond. And so we may take a moment and talk through 
who would you like us to call, mm-hmm. mom or dad, or care which caregiver? So we give them choices so that they don't feel like um, we're just dictating to them. And we walk through like why they might be worried or you know make mm-hmm. sure that there aren't any safety risks for calling. Um, but I think some of the greatest moments is mm-hmm. when they do come in and the parents yeah. tell and the parent just says, oh my goodness, I, I wish you would have yeah. told me. And I I'm, love you. Yeah. It's okay, you know, let's start right now to get you better. And I cry every time at that moment. I mean, it's just, like, so touching. Um, we also educate parents at that moment. Um, so I know you guys have already reviewed the paperwork, but, like, at the bottom of the paperwork is a checklist of things that we give advice to parents on, which is to watch their child for 24 or 7, to make sure they know where their child is, to make sure they know their child is safe to make sure that if there is access to weapons and prescription drugs, guns, knives, that, um, that they take away that access. Um, we also recommend that, uh, they start, that they may need to start therapy. Um, and I talked about that. It could be on campus or off campus. Um, and yeah, and that's about it. But we, we make sure that when they leave, they feel comfortable, the student and the parent, talking about the topic openly. We make sure that parents understand that it is acceptable for them to say, are you feeling suicidal? And that that's a, that's a good conversation to have with their child. So I talked about when the answers are all no. <laughs> but um, if the answers were all yes, then it would be clear that the student needed to be hospitalized. And so, um, or at least get some extra support. Yeah. Sometimes when we call the crisis team, which is what our next step is, mm-hmm. they don't feel like they yeah. um, need to be hospitalized, and they'll help us walk through that process. But at that point, we know that it's beyond um, that we've exhausted all the resources that we have on our campus, and so we do need to access some extra support. Yeah. So, so we are thinking there's a you know there's a, a decent chance this person needs to ho- be hospitalized. So there's a couple people we can call. We can call um, CERT team, which stands for Crisis Intervention Response Team. Yeah, which is now the crisis team is all they're called. Okay. And um, it's, it's great. Yeah. So they send a team of people. It's usually two or three people. Uh, one person might be a therapist. One person might be a nurse. One person might be... Like a behaviorist. Is this the yeah. county or a yeah. city thing? Uh, Ventura County Behavioral yeah. Health county. now yeah. holds the contract for the crisis team. They usually, you know, they have to get their team together. They're not just kind of sitting around all together waiting for us to call, but they get their team together. They usually come to us in about 45 minutes, yeah. which is great. Um, and it used to be two hours, so we are down to like 45 minutes. That is fantastic. To be, so. Yeah, and for us, we want parent involvement. Like, as soon as we understand what's going on, we want the parent in the room, and, and, um, and they also want parent involvement. And so they will re-ask the questions. They will re-have the student tell their life story, what they're having trouble coping with, what their coping skills are, and they will make a final decision about whether they're hospitalized or not. Does that happen on campus? Yeah. Yeah, all with us being able to support everybody. And if the crisis team said we can't come for two hours, um, the police force has CIT trained officers, so crisis intervention trained um, officers that will come to campus, and they are taught to come on campus and not exert their They're amazing power, too. but yeah. to come in soft. And we've utilized um, our officers within our community, and they've been fantastic. Yeah. They come in, and they can really get down on the kids' level and talk with them about what they see. Um, they oftentimes give them like their cell phone number, their work cell phone number, so yeah. that students can text them off hours, because sometimes they're working at like 2 o'clock in the morning, and the students actually sometimes develop an ongoing relationship with the police officer that helped them. Of the 20 to 30 that mm-hmm. you see every year, what percentage would you say answers yes um, to your questions? Not very and, many. Yeah, not very many very at well. all. And, and um, like I would say maybe one or two a year are hospitalized yeah. for a few days. And so most, most are feeling so overwhelmed by whatever situation they're in that they forget what their coping skills are. And then what, what happens, and it's like magic, is like you, you say to them, like, what are the things when you don't feel good? Like, when you didn't feel good two months ago, what did you do to feel better? Um, and they know the answers, but they can't think about them right in that moment um, when they were feeling stressed and they actually texted that they were suicidal. Um, once they remember their coping skills, they do quite well. And then we always check in with people the next day. So... Um, 
nine times out of ten, the students <coughs> come back and say, I feel so much better. And I did. I implemented these coping skills. I listened to music and I went for a hike last night and my mom checked in on me every so often and I feel so much better. Um, and so then it's just reminding them of like what skills they have to take care of themselves, but they forgot them when they were stressed out. And then if, if someone is hospitalized, they would generally be gone for maybe two or three days. Um, likely, it could be longer, but it's usually like two or three days. What, and when what they does come, that hospitalization in, involve? I mean, they literally put somebody in a hospital bed? 5150? Yeah. They do. Um, so we can initiate a 5150, but the crisis team will invoke it, where they actually do take them in a special car. At that point, sometimes the police do come, and um, they do put them in a police car, so that they're safe. They can't, or an ambulance. Or an ambulance. an ambulance. They can't jump out of the car, because at this point... Um, you know, we want to make sure that they're safe in transportation, um, period. And they do go into, um, like, Vista Del Mar is one of our hospitals. Um, unfortunately, they've had a lot of um, damage. Um, from the fire. From the fire. Mm -hmm. And so, but they keep them there and assess them to see what else needs to happen um, over these 72 hours. And it is, it's, they're, they don't have access a lot of times to socks, anything that, um, yeah, harm them. So I no think the socks, important no. part to remember is like if someone is hospitalized, it's because they don't believe that they're safe one minute alone. It's right. imminent threat of harm. Yeah, absolutely. It is the and that's why there's one, maybe two. I would say mostly one. Yeah. Some years none. Yeah, and um, and when they leave the hospital, they have a referral to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, you know, they kind of assess what's going on with them and then they refer them to the right, the correct right. intervention. And we work really hard um, with the families um, for a re-entry plan yeah. to see what was going on, um, if it was stress at home, um, to make sure that we're checking out on them, or if um, it was school-based, we can provide extra services to support them. And that's where um, you guys talked about individual, right? T helping the individual, whether it be start time and or changing in schedule, <coughs> that's where we work with the students most of the time on their individual basis to, to support their needs. Then obviously if people said yes to the questions that I went over in the beginning, we're not, we, we may not even get to the coping skills, right? Because they're not going to sign the contract saying they're not going to harm themselves. So that's what Janine's talking about. When we get, when they get back, before they come back to school, we set up a meeting where we create a safety plan with them. So at that point, the safety plan's appropriate, right? Because they've gotten a few days worth of help, whereas it wouldn't be appropriate the day that they needed to be hospitalized. And it just lets them know that we're there to continue to work with their families or caregivers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, their parent, we have their parents and them in that meeting. And just making sure that they feel comfortable at school and everywhere. Any questions about the actual intervention part? So important pieces, not leaving them alone, mm -hmm. supporting them, talking with them, utilizing the language that works best for them, hearing from their perspective, whether it's a breakup or something that I think some people might think is silly, we meet them where they are and mm -hmm. we understand that for them that is a major happening in their life and um, we you know, don't want to minimize it. And if they're joking, we still engage them in talking with us because we take all um, and we still call comments the and we still call the parents. <laughs> we take all comments very serious. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, obviously the conversation is different with the parents. It's not from a discipline standpoint, though. Yeah. It's more from the, um, the students and the parents understanding how serious we take the comment so that we don't want people to say it unless they mean it. And when they mean it, we do want them to say it. <laughs> yeah. One balance I would think it would be hard to achieve would be you know, in an ideal world, if someone had even in, invoked suicide and then you went through your process and mm -hmm. let's say they were one of the more, you know, mm -hmm. readily resolvable mm -hmm. cases, okay. in an ideal world, if you didn't worry about privacy, mm -hmm. you'd want all the teachers to know to kind of keep an eye on, like, we, it's noticing yeah. anything different. So how, how do you handle out. the... We, yeah. So we do, at this, we ask permission to the students to tell their teachers, and um, we explain to them if their teachers understood uh, what they had been going through, that um, they would better be able to serve them. Like they, I mean, they may not be able to do their homework that night, right? So at the very basic level, let's, let's, let's excuse them from homework that night, you know? And so um, I find that students eagerly want their teachers to know. Um, the and other, we, don't, we don't use suicide. We'll say that they're going through a hard time right yeah. now, necessarily. So yeah. we do talk with the students and the parents about what language they'd like us to use. So yeah. we're not just telling their business. Yeah. yeah. Um, and But we also want 
teachers, I mean, okay, so this year I'm teaching. I, I'm a counselor, but I'm also a 20% teacher. And I was a teacher before I was a counselor, so it's not new to me, but um, I'm back <coughs> in it after like not teaching for 10 years. And um, as a teacher, we have so much more time with students. I spend an hour a day with my class. And every other day, a student says to me, can I talk to you just for a minute outside? You know, and I leave the door open and we step a little bit outside and they're whispering to me where I can see everybody. And they're telling me what's going on in their life because it affects their classroom and and their homework and you know and they want me to know that this is why I didn't do this or you know and so I think it's super important for teachers to know yeah and and students generally by the time they're in high school know that and agree with that so we do send an email to teachers um, before the next day and it's not new any time that I present um, to students I always ask them to identify, to raise their hands if they have somebody on campus that they feel safe talking to. And, um, and if they don't, you know, some kids are quieter or just don't, I say, okay, you trust your friends, ask your friends who they trust and mm -hmm. why, and talk with them about mm -hmm. that. Because um, it's really important that they can identify somebody on campus that they can go to in an emergency. That's actually pretty common. My friend said that I should talk to you about yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. So we do talk about that. Tell your friend things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's our intervention part. And then our postvention. Um, so a while back, we're so lucky that you're here tonight, for our wellness policy. <laughs> part of our wellness policy, we met, how many years ago? Is that five, six? A couple. No, um, I think when we about developed three. it. About three? Well, yeah, I think it was mandated in 2006. And okay. we just created it as a district, and then we revisited it about two or three years okay. ago. Um, and part of our wellness um, policy is um, how we address um, emergencies. So it's not specific. There's protocols for addressing um, crisis in our district, so it's not specific to suicide. But again, it's talking about a team of people, a crisis team that's going to get together, whether it's a death or um, a suicide, and we're going to talk about how to best support our students and what that looks like. And so we do have protocols um, that we follow. And a lot of times we just we meet as a team and talk about what are our options. How can we support the students individually in well, a group? And, and honestly, if an emergency happening happens, we're all calling each other at like one and two in the morning, yes. planning what we're going to talk about at six a.m. when we get there early. So like it it happens the minute we know about the emergency, no matter what time it is. <coughs> and how we're going to um, support the teachers and who's going to talk about it and um, who has the best relationship with the family so that we can talk with them about the best way to support them and um, get the information out and can also maintain privacy but continue to talk with the students so that they feel supported because um, especially in a suicide we wouldn't want contagion which has happened in other districts that are nearby so we want to make sure that we have students that feel supported and have an outlet um, to address some of those complex um, feelings that they're going through. Yeah, at that point we could do individual counseling, group counseling. We oftentimes will do something like make a memory book for the person. And so we do kind of like group counseling while they're doing art and drawing their memory book and telling their stories. And, and they talk and yeah, then they, they cry and then they're yeah. silent and then there's more crying and then somebody usually wants to get food. So then mm. usually we bring in food. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's usually how it happens and it's an all day thing and usually within a day, a day and a half, yeah. everybody's back to their classes and um, knows that they can continue to access support. And then afterwards. it switches more to individual. At first it usually starts out as group and switches more to individual or like maybe two people at a time. And we have them sign in so that we can keep track, so that we can follow up with any students that maybe we're concerned about. Mm -hmm. So that's our process, prevention, intervention, and postvention. Any questions from anybody? I have a question about prevention. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about girls empowerment and boys mm -hmm. integrity groups. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how many kids are accessing those mm -hmm. groups, um, especially boys um, integrity, if it's well or not. I think a lot. Um, Jim Hall did a fantastic job at offering um, students to be able to go during his, was it his health class or tutorial, I think he would give extra credit mm -hmm. for um, the students that wanted to participate. And um, a lot of girls, you know, usually they're, they first get it, we do sixth grade now, right? We offer it to the sixth graders. So usually that's a beginning. And then they get a big piece of it in junior high. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think 100%. I would say probably anywhere between 60 and 80% of the kids um, volunteer and sign up in junior high. Um, less 
males and females. And then um, at the high school, those that are interested continue on. And then the usually you have the freshmen that have seniors that are talking to them. And it's just kind of a way for us to continue the conversations. Um, we do have parent permission because it does happen after school at the junior high, which is nice because then they can dive deeper into some of these topics that wouldn't be appropriate to talk about during the school day or in the middle of the school day. Yeah. And I might have missed it, but when um, Janine was talking about Safe Talk, she also trains, trains students on Safe Talk, like hundreds of students um, at the high school level. Yeah, I really like it. Which I, I think <laughs> makes people feel more comfortable <coughs> talking about. Is that something that happens every year mm -hmm. that you train students? Yeah, the, when mm -hmm. the teachers ask leadership and um, dance. Those are my two classes that I typically end up going into. And um, um, although I did science last year, um, I did Safe Talk at the end of the year with the science class. And yeah, they, wow, they really, I don't know, it's one of my favorite times because mm -hmm. The questions that they ask and to just, I don't know, their brains are going and they have such great ideas that really they can already help each other and themselves and their families and their mm -hmm. friends and their younger siblings. And um, really it's just about engaging in conversation, which is the biggest piece. Yeah, about not being afraid to talk. Um, I haven't been, we do have it, and if they wanted me to go in, I'd be happy to. Yeah, usually they, um, but then I hold it outside. This year, I had one scheduled for um, teenagers and their parents to come together, and then the fire happened, so it got canceled because it was during the December. So I'll um, hold another one. Um, and then lastly, so when I was here last year talking about bullying prevention, we talked about having um, a web page, and we do have a web page. So I hope that you have visited the web page, the mental health web page, and that talks about bullying prevention, suicide prevention, um, as well as um, school-based counseling. And then there's lots of resources on the page. You know, Michael, you mentioned that what she was talking about, if I walk around and I see somebody alone, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a thing. There's a program I've seen is starting to spread to schools, high schools, across the mm -hmm. man. I can't remember where he was. I'll have to look it up. But he started a, basically a group on campus that, and I'm sure they don't do it every day, but mm -hmm. at, at lunchtime, yes. they go, anytime there's a kid who's sitting by themselves, they go and have lunch day. with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, it's like it's, it's a cool, cool thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is for to step out of your own comfort zone to mm -hmm. walk up to a stranger, not know what they're going to say to you, mm -hmm. and ask them to have lunch with you. Mm -hmm. Or to, that to me just shows a lot of composure mm -hmm. and um, way to put yourself out there. Because I think it's hard for adults to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we know what it's like to be at a meeting or at a party or something, mm -hmm. and everybody's just kind of quiet and sticks with their own mm -hmm. group. So for those students that can do it, and I hope that we help them feel more comfortable mm -hmm. doing that. And that is kind of the model of senior siblings a bit, um, but obviously you're assigned to someone. So this would be more open, which would be great. Yeah. Kids talk. They just say who. I have one question, and I think I heard the answer. I just wanted to be sure. Of, okay. of those kids, you said that there are some kids that you're actually sort of chronic. You're dealing with mm -hmm. them all mm -hmm. the way through. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure I heard you say this, but I want to double check. Do we, we, we circle back and make sure that they have some sort of programmatic mm -hmm. support, right? Absolutely. Some, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, it doesn't, good and healthy coping skills, if you don't have any, don't develop mm -hmm. overnight. And so we, it does take us a while mm -hmm. to right. help them. And, and mm -hmm. like an outside therapist or something. And yeah. Maybe they're, you're They're in needing school. it all the yeah. time for four years, so yes. this is going on. Yes, yeah. and sometimes we can provide it in-house so that we okay. can work together with the teachers as a um, collaborative group to help support them, which is why I like counseling in the schools is because... We can do, wrap around the kids, right. um, especially if it's for school-based issues. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah. Thank you. But if it has okay. something to do with like depression, or okay. then they need um, more. I, yeah. Yeah. I've missed many, many meetings, so I don't know if this has ever come up. Or, um, what's the name of this organization? I have never read about it in the paper. Um, do, do, do we have history of suicides of kids in our schools? I'm like so afraid to even say that. But no. <laughs> I mean, I had a morbid question to ask. No. Not I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, you know, I follow the story of the, like, for example, the opioid ODs. There yeah. are all kinds of ODs that happen in our town. They don't mm -hmm. get a lot of press for some reason, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, but, but, okay, that's not. We have dealt OD. with deaths of students in the past, but not, yeah, luckily, a suicide. And I was just curious, because now I'm remembering. <laughs> Um, this horrible TV series, was it this mm -hmm. year? Uh, 13 like, Reasons Why. Yeah. Like, did that, um, 
I don't know. Change. Season two changed, I guess. Change. They must have but done a better job. We didn't see an increase. No. No. I think but students they, were already comfortable talking about it before we were that came that out. We were worried that they was going to create an yeah. instigate. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. Kind of, okay, that's nice. but the good thing is, I guess, in respect that they were talking about it. So yeah. right. when we heard kids talking about it, we talked with them about it, which mm -hmm. I thought was important. Yeah. And I'm hoping, and I'm sure parents at home are doing the same, um, sitting and watching it with them or having those conversations um, about how would they feel and what would they mm -hmm. do. And yeah. yeah. Any one else with a question? Thanks a lot. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to item 7.1.1. Sure, this is the resolution. Remember in March we did something very similar for our certificate staff. Um, this is the initiating process in order for us to begin the notice period to inform employees who may be at risk of not returning for the upcoming school year uh, based on either declining enrollment, um, lack of work, or lack of funds. Um, so this is, you know, the second part in a two-part, uh, um, you know, series of resolutions that are certainly one of my least favorite uh, things to do uh, anytime. Um, so we do, unfortunately, just as we had with the certificate, we had 6.65 uh, teachers who were identified in the resolution last month. Um, we worked very closely with Chuck Crawford and the entire uh, CSEA uh, leadership team. Um, to try to determine the best way for us to realize the necessary savings given our budgetary challenge, uh, as well as looking at what the real impact was from declining enrollment. Um, you know, they're obviously, on the certificate side, it's a bit easier to see when you lose 30 students on elementary level, it's pretty natural to reduce by one teacher, but um, really engaging in robust conversations about, uh, you know, what does it look like a, a high school of 700 students versus a high school of 1,000 plus when it comes to office support time. Um, and so, uh, you know, those type of conversations, I think we met in truck, what, 20 hours over a two-week span, uh, obviously some really challenging conversations, um, but ultimately very productive. And I think that, um, you know, we'll, we'll get in soon to uh, hopefully uh, our next agenda item where we'll be able to discuss that we do have a goal of, of course, being able to rescind these, if possible, if we are able to either have a better uh, budget outlook or find other ways for cost reductions that don't involve uh, reducing staff time, but that is what this resolution before you is for. Any questions? <coughs> Anyone would like to make a uh, move on it? I'll move to um, approve this resolution. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And now we're moving to 7.1.2. Um, this is, uh, as I just was referencing, um, <coughs> we, when we met with CSEA, uh, the conversations uh, were by uh, legal necessity very restricted in ways in which we could be looking at our overall budgetary picture as it relates to CSEA staffing. Because we would not received uh, this letter or had it formally go to you yet, um, we had received this letter at the time we were having the conversations, but it had not gone to you until uh, tonight. This is the first step, and you'll see our response is the next agenda item that allow us to open up the entire um, contract for negotiations. We are in um, the final year of our current agreement. Um, I came onto the district in May of 15, and we signed the, uh, the current agreement within a few months of my arrival. Um, and so hard to believe it. we're already coming up on three years. But um, we will be beginning <laughs> negotiations. We already have a few dates scheduled in May. Uh, to be looking at, again, the, the complete picture that we have been engaging OFT in for this entire year, uh, we'll begin that process with CSEA. So just as with OFT, uh, you know, very collaborative process. I hate to even call it negotiations because it certainly is not what you typically think of with, uh, you know, people sitting at opposite sides of the table and I take and you lose and, you know, that sort of thing. That You know, we really are working together in each of these meetings of trying to find, um, you know, the best outcome for, for all staff and for all students. And so... Um, I look forward to the opportunity to, to meet with Chuck and his team, and again, this is their, their initial uh, statement to us as to the areas of priority they have as we look at the contract. Don't leave it all on the practice field because we have to open that public hearing now. Right. I was just going right. to say, I'll move to <laughs> Don't, don't to use up all your words <laughs> before we open the public hearing. So does anyone have a motion to open the public hearing? I'll do so. A second? Second. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So we are now... Uh, at sea in a Waiting public hearing. Rush of people to speak on this? Chuck. 
I have a guest with me I'd like to uh, present to the podium as well, if you will. Uh, Henry Caron is our regional representative for CSEA. And um, CSEA knows the 10 years that we've been through here. Ojai Unified has certainly led the county in hardships. And I wanted Henry to come and see the board in action. I think uh, we have had that collaborative that Andy speaks of uh, for many years. Uh, CSEA also finds it interesting to find Josh down the valley and uh, Suzanne Lagatoff down the valley and Danny <coughs> Pusateri down the valley. So um, they're all beginning to feel those things that we've worked on so many years. And that's why I wanted Henry to come and see you guys in action because I really do think we have a unique thing happening here in Ojai. Um, we're, not, we're not usually, we're usually a little bit better than this, I got to tell you. <laughs> I'm injured. <laughs> well, I want to share with you, having brought that up. Uh, uh, um, we, we did trees uh, during that spring break. Got a lot of tree work done, uh, the maintenance staff. Um, that has become a priority due to some unfortunate things this last year. I became sick the second week. And Monday, there was no power down around Nordoff High School and the hospital and the doctors and that. I called my doctor, because I sounded worse than you did, and, and they called back and said, the only thing we have is a telephone. So I took my flashlight and a checkbook and went down there. And, and to me, those doctors over there is what this community is all about. Because they saw me, I needed to be seen. Got my medicine, got care with a flashlight and a checkbook. That's right? great. And, and so to me, that's what my classified staff do here on a regular basis, is that we adapt, we adapt, we adapt. And just seeing those 27 people on that list that you just signed on was very painful. And it was a very long conversation. And I understand that we manage the way we do, and we, um, we will negotiate the effects of that. So I wanted to, one, introduce Henry to you, let him speak on behalf of the CSEA because they watch from a distance of what's happening here. I thank you for opening this up. I look forward to some honest conversation. I feel that we've done that, and I really do appreciate uh, your efforts as we go forward. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, good evening, board members and administrative staff. Uh, Again, my name is Henry Caron, the Region 8 Regional Representative. I am the eyes and ears of the Association President. I'm here in support of my brother Chuck and my fellow brothers and sisters of uh, Ojai Chapter 333. And, you know, um, I won't be here as long as he needs me. Um, keep coming to these board meetings. And, you know, like he says, we're well aware of the situation, and I'm going to be more involved uh, going forward from now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to meet you. Well, I'm sure we, I speak for the whole board. I think you're doing a heck of a job, Chuck. And, you know, there are many nights when there's only a couple of people here, and it's basically Angie and Chuck. So, well done. Your constituents owe you. Uh, anyone like to move to close that public meeting, unless there are any further comments to be made? I'll move to close the public meeting. I will hearing. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now we move to point three, which I believe... Do we have to move to... Accept the letter? Yeah, we do. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'll make a motion to accept the letter. Or is that the correct way to put it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Shane. And now we open another public meeting, although maybe you want to preamble, Andy? Sure. So this is, again, just the, the second part of uh, the last um, uh, item. This is our response. What you'll see in this response is simply that the uh, articles and issues that CSEA has identified as uh, <coughs> discussed with us, we, we welcome that discussion. We look forward to, again, the same collaborative negotiations and, and meetings that we've had historically. And so that's really the, it's a legal, you know, procedural step that uh, is our, our response to their uh, proposal. And so uh, this may look eerily similar to what you approved in 2015 as well. Although in this case, we merely are, well, we are obligated to, to have a public hearing, but no action. Correct, correct. because this is our district's, posi right. district's response. Right. And for us to act on it would be like we're crazy, because we'd be saying, <laughs> we approve what we've done. Right. And then it would be like, you're madness. Well, I'll make a motion to open a public hearing. I will say. No, go ahead. I'm seconding like crazy tonight. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Anyone? I'll move to close the public hearing. <laughs> I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item, where are we now? 7.1.4. So this resolution uh, comes to you a bit early, um, but because of the timing of our board meeting in May, we, uh, we're going to be midway through the week at the time that uh, this resolution would come before you. So we wanted to, to be sure that we had it approved in advance uh, and make sure it gets out to the school sites. This is a resolution in recognition of California Teacher Appreciation Week, May 7th through the 11th, and California Day of the Teacher, which is on the same day of our board meeting. So. Uh, I'll be sure to email each of our board members uh, the um, celebrations that are taking place that week um, because I know that you uh, feel as I do of how worthy they are of celebration and I'm, I'm sure that we will uh, have the opportunity that week to be able to uh, um, identify even more so our uh, positive feelings. And I'll just note uh, one of the whereases, which really kind of gets to the heart of it. The Ojai Unified School District Board of Education recognizes the truly vital role of teachers in realizing the mission of the Ojai Unified School District to provide a high quality educational program and learning environment delivered by talented staff, uh, which I'm sure we all wholeheartedly agree with. And the whereas before, of, we have the highest respect and admiration for the profession of teachers. Hear, hear. So I'll move to approve this resolution for teacher appreciation i will second all those in favor aye. Aye. aye moving to 7.4 let's see i'm sorry 7.3.1 right so this is our annual re uh, review of our district of choice applications just a reminder we are one of three school districts in ventura county that is a district of choice uh, this means that we can accept students from outside of our district who are requesting to transfer in, even if the sending district doesn't approve it. Um, typically, the process for inter-district transfers is the, the district of residence of the child and the receiving district both approve it. Um, if the student uh, submits their request by December 31st, of the year preceding the school year, um, then we automatically get to take them. And as you guys know, we're taking every child we can. We, we love uh, adding to our enrollment. Uh, so unfortunately this year, like the past few, we did not have any who sought the process by this method. That's actually though uh, not a, a, a true negative because the reason for this is that we really have a very strong relationship with our neighboring districts in um, being able to have a, a free flow of students back and forth uh, regardless of this district of choice um, option. So of course we have many students who our inter-district transfers to us. Um, in fact, I believe the, the number for this year hovers right around 300 students. About 15% of our student body throughout the entire district is inter-district, coming primarily from Oakview, um, but that, again, they're not actually utilizing this mechanism to come to our district. And the only district that we would need this mechanism for is Santa Paula? Correct, that's exactly right. Or if there ever were a change with, uh, with other districts. So Oak, uh, Oak Park, for instance, is another district in the county that is a district of choice. They rely very heavily on this district of choice option um, because they receive, I think they're near half of their student populations coming from outside of their boundaries, many of which are coming from uh, Cheryl's former district of Simi Unified. Um, and so Simi you know, is, is not supportive of losing their students to Oak Park um, and so they, um, they are one of the largest advocates in the state for Oak Park is uh, for this district of choice option. Uh, every few years it comes in the news that it may end. In fact, just this past year, it was something that uh, we were frequently getting requests that we advocate up at the, uh, Sacramento to make sure this continues. Frankly, this is really just, as you can see, not, not a mechanism or a tool that we've been utilizing lately because it's not been necessary. Um, so. Just so everyone knows, we're district of choice, but again, it's not the method really needed for us. This is an information item. If anyone has a further question, um, ask it. Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay. Moving on. So now, update on Measure J Project 7.4.1. So our big update is actually coming at 7.4.2. Uh, this is just a standing agenda item for each month to make sure that we do provide to the board and the community the 
latest financial information. Um, so you'll see on page two um, our current funds available uh, in our uh, uh, um, account, bank account. Uh, you'll notice that we still have eight or eight million dollars in bonds to sell. Uh, we're right now aiming for twenty or twenty-one to be the time that we sell that last issuance. Uh, but this gives you the full full picture of current since inception uh, expenditures. That's uh, two million two hundred seventy-five thousand in expenditures year to, uh, since inception. Um, one thing to note, uh, although of course we were not doing this <coughs> intentionally uh, in the uh, speed with which we've developed projects, but one benefit in us being a little bit slow out of the gates as we're developing all of our planning is that we have actually earned $170,000 in interest um, that you can see identified there as far as revenue that helps our bond go a little bit further. Um, so that's that item. Hey, are they encumbrances? Is that like a mechanics lien, stuff like that? Um, so that would be, for instance, the 7.4.3 of how we've completed the roofing project from last summer, right. but we haven't fully released that final uh, amount for the, the project until we certify completion. So that's some of it. Some of it might be our uh, DSA closeout projects that we, we already know that we're going to be utilizing uh, a certain service to complete the project, okay. but we just haven't received the invoice yet. So moving then to the action item, which is 7.4.2. And we do have our, uh, not sure which title to use for you, David. Uh, <laughs> just about every title in the district uh, at this point in our some way. Bond yeah. <laughs> our acting bond manager, our, our director of operations, we have uh, David Rogers, who can give a, a brief overview of um, the, uh, one of the most significant projects we're working on this summer, a nearly $3 million project of uh, replacing the roofs at five of our campuses. I do see that we have our uh, rep with Garland here as well, and so if we have any uh, specific to uh, to the actual roof itself, um, we we have that available. So thank you very much, Jason, for being here as well. Actually, Appreciate before, that. before David starts, uh, that was my yeah. question. So they just are providing materials? Correct. <clears throat> so That's unusual, isn't it? It is unusual, but it's to our benefit in many ways. Um, we are able to use the CMAS contract, which allows us to procure material ahead of time. So we actually... When we get approval today, we'll have materials stored in a warehouse ready to go. Um, kind of avoid those issues with having five different contractors this summer not able to get the exact flashing or the exact material or part that they require. So also uh, the CMAS stuff is competitively bid ahead of time by the, a governing board through California's CMAS, um, California Multiple Award Schedules program. So we don't have to competitively bid it. It also... Uh, at, lessens the headache with that portion of, uh, we might have a really good contractor, but then the <laughs> material cost is really high, and so it really <coughs> simplified the project immensely. That's great. And also the warranty portion, Jason, that um, will be, you. yeah, through you, and that our Nordoff gym as well is the same yeah. warranty. So uh, actually we, during our recent rain event, had an issue, and you guys fixed it within a couple hours, and so, was really awesome to make one phone call and magic happened. So, <laughs> yeah. and the so CMAS contract we estimated, you know, by avoiding contract and markup by the district purchasing directly, uh, estimated about one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars in savings. Um, CMAS gives a small discount, but contract and markup is huge. Right. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. So you'll see um, in the the uh, document that I created, uh, we've got Nordoff, Matillaha, Miners Oaks, Miramonte, and Topa Topa. Uh, the most interesting thing about it, building A, C, D, <laughs> the way that they're done, um, I just have to say it's kind of crazy. We have three separate maps. So the C wing at Nordoff is also the C wing on one map, but on another map is some other like K designation that's way older from like the 40s. So I think it's 40s. But uh, it's, it's very interesting. So I drew some maps at the very end of this. So you could actually see that Nordoff is highlighted in green. Uh, C and D wings, and then Matillaha, so those three buildings are where the roofs will be replaced. Miners Oaks, uh, almost every roof that wasn't done last summer, um, and Miramonte, so um, a bulk of Miramonte as well. And Topa, again in green. I hope that came out in color. I didn't yeah. see Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, looks good. So How is it that at Topa Topa you have the one portable building and only part of it needs Roofing. So at Topa Topa, that section uh, that is not green, those portables are being removed. Huh, that's yeah. brilliant. Don't re-roof those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are 
beyond repair. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I was, was just up there, so. Yeah. I, yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, I was just up there and I remarked, "Wow, these should really be removed." And then I remembered that they are <laughs> <laughs> being removed. Okay. So, uh, tried to give you guys a little bit of project scope. Um, you know, the different uh, edge metal flashing. Um, so the roofing labor you'll see, this is our bid tabulation form. So this is what I sent to the contractors noticing or allowing them to see uh, who won the lowest bids. And as you can see, you know, having uh, five sites and five different contractors made it interesting. Hopefully that, that does make sense and it's easy to see with the yellow there that... Uh, Should we automatically go with the lowest bidder? Is that we do, yeah. So on this project, we had language in the original bid document that we uh, would choose the lowest individual bidder <laughs> instead of just the lowest bidder, because there was some question to that uh, effect when I first took over, uh, but I was able to find the, the language that we, we did put in. So go with lowest individual bidder per project, and that way it allowed bidders to bid on one or, or two projects instead of having to bid all five as well. And, and they do their it's the lowest qualifying bid and so they obviously if uh, we actually didn't include it in here but David goes through an extensive check mark box to make sure that they do meet all of our qualifications to you know we don't have a, a fly by night <coughs> company that you know we're going to qualify or you know offer the contract to and then they're a non performer so they do yeah. go through a qualification process. But is there a concern about this commercial roofing system having three, how are they gonna do three buildings in one summer? So that was part of the lengthy process. I should have said lowest qualified and responsive bidder. Uh, so I checked out their DIR, um, Better Business Bureau, which isn't actually that great of an industry uh, business, but still trying to get an idea. The uh, California Labor Management Board also keeps extensive records on any reports for these companies that people come against them. Um, you know, checking out Yelp if there's anything on there. Most of them didn't. It's kind of residential versus commercial. Uh, just trying to get a just uh, an idea of who these people were and what types of projects they could do. And I believe commercials got Jason like 500 employees or, or three, Not quite that big, I think it's there 350. Yeah, it's 350 or something like that. So they could so, do all. So they were five. saying they could do all five. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So they have the staff and capable they of doing all. all yeah, they have the staff and capable of doing all three sites. Yeah. They're still bidding projects right now. I mean, they're looking. Yeah, and also uh, one thing that isn't apparent in here, but most of these folks will use a subcontractor for demolition of the roof. So they're not gonna like they can tear off at one site one week and then start building at that site and then tear off and build. And so it's not may not be that they're there, you know, at all three at the same time. So uh, next section, uh, roofing materials we kind of already went over, <clears throat> so you can see there. Um, and then I add tallied up, oh, it looks, yeah, tallied up the uh, materials labor cost for your totals. And so we are very happy to share that if you recall back in October, we presented to you our overall bond plan for the full $35 million. However, we uh, only identified pricing at the site level rather than on the individual project level. Um, we will present to you, uh, obviously, the summer, uh, actually be in writing, the individual sites and the budget. <coughs> but what I can share is that this came in $400,000 below the budget that we identified back in October. And we actually added, was it two additional buildings? That, uh, so it actually is uh, two additional buildings and a, a, a cost um, you know, well below 10%, um, you know, below the, uh, the number that we have. So that does mean you know, funds available for... Um, other projects within our, our bond plan. So that's, that's very, very exciting. I knew it was going to have an impact when we said you guys could s keep half the money you save. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear about that. <laughs> so is there something about, I'm just curious, yeah. why, why there were so few bids on Miramonte uh, or, or Miners Oaks? Is there anything you can uh, about that or just capacity issues with the, with the bidders? I want to say, I think with Miramonte, the, the issue is actually some of that, uh, it's hard to see in the picture, but if you look at the green, there's a little red stripe all around. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is, I actually do a lot of work, well, did a lot of work up on that. It's terrifying. All of that is rusted. It, the, the surface has actually failed. The galvanizing has failed. So that's just rusted steel. And so that's going to require an extensive amount of prep and repair. Mm -hmm. And I think that may have been, a, you know, to our detriment because it's going to be a considerable amount of labor and time. So, 
Yeah, the other sites, uh, they have the same roof style at Miner's Oaks, but Miner's Oaks went with a tar and gravel patch over the top of it instead of just the straight galvanized steel, so it lasts uh, a lot longer. Yeah, of course. Um, when this happens, what, um, will there be an impact to the inside of the classrooms in any way? Do teachers need to be aware of what's happening when? <coughs> It will. De we won't be able to determine that right at this moment. <clears throat> when we pull off the old roof, there will probably be several sheets of plywood that need to be pulled up and replaced. We try to mitigate the amount of people's legs who go through <laughs> the roof, but that stuff does happen. And so, the the worst case scenario I could think of is somebody actually was a, you know able to put a tool or a leg through the the building and knock some of the tiles below down into the classroom. At that point, you know, we would go through our cleanup and uh, restore it, uh, which we got some practice with the uh, Thomas Fire, so we're good at uh, cleaning <laughs> up the classrooms and restoring them to their original state. But, um, Angie, the, the classrooms will be out of use completely <clears throat> during the period of construction, so that, <clears throat> that certainly will disrupt our, our staff and at each of our sites, and that communication will be going out yeah. upon approval uh, of, of this uh, program moving forward. Good, yeah, I think people do a lot of work in their classrooms all summer long. Mm -hmm. I know I do, and I know, I just know people are in and out yeah. uh, doing things, and if they can't be in their classroom, they would want to know now as soon as rather possible. than mm -hmm. later. Sure, yeah, absolutely. As soon as possible. Yeah, so the way I see it going, uh, because of the schedules being, like I said, they're going to have people on site, uh, not short notice, but relatively short notice, uh, I'd like to have them set out cones specifically at Nordoff. We're going to actually section off the entire C and D wing area, but there may be point, points where when one is done, we can actually lower that restriction and kind of go week by week. So we will definitely keep you guys uh, updated. That would be great. Yeah. I, I just really feel like a lot of us, like from from myself, I'm going to be gone a good portion of the summer, mm -hmm. and I'm already planning to be there at a certain time, mm -hmm. which means. If I can't be there, then I need to know as soon as possible so I can get done whatever I do. Well, luckily, now. your room is not going to be done. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but right. If you, we you, know, you know what I mean. I yeah. feel like it, that's sure. just me, and I, I, there are many other teachers out there. So, I just. Very important. That just would be so, so uh, respectful, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Is there any issue with like insulation when that happens, too? Or. or <coughs> There really shouldn't be much impact to the internal structures, uh, but yeah, if, yeah, if there is, it will be a uh, large impact. So we're hoping to mitigate that. Though. We, we've done two of these projects so far and we had no issues. That's not to say we won't, but the impact of the room was zero at the, on both of those, the gym and the rooms. Exactly, yeah. And knowing some of these roofs, having walked on some of these roofs, I know that underneath them is going to require some work, so yeah. You're so we do ask for approval to authorize us to move forward with authorizing the contracts for the respective sites and contractors. I'll make a motion to approve and award roofing contracts and material costs for the five schools as stated. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And now we're moving to 7.4.3. Great job, David. Thank you. thank you. And thank you, Jason, for being here. Um, this is uh, just a, the final step. Uh, due to the uh, value of the project at Nordoff, you'll be seeing these uh, coming forward for some of these roofing projects and other projects as well. Uh, we have to have a formal notice of completion to be able to authorize that final payment and to communicate with the state agencies that oversee these projects. So. I am informing you the project is complete and requesting authorization to uh, to finalize this document and authorize final payment to the company. Was this, this sorry? This document assures that in future worlds, DSA doesn't come back and say, "Well, this item is still open; that we have to take care of it later." That's what this is. No, this is for no. the uh, roofing contractor to uh, um, receive their final payment. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a notice to other agencies that potentially have a lien on that, that contractor. And so it's a legal notice of the, the contractor. This was not a project that actually went to DSA. So this is not 
um, a DSA document. That's what I was going to say. I, I recall that the roofs didn't require that's any right. DSA. That's right. That's but right. in the future, on a project that does, we don't. No, that's for sure. Yeah. Do this until certainly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, we would expect an additional, an additional document <laughs> right. signed in blood by DSA. Yes, right. yes. <coughs> right. All those in uh, favor of approving this? Fine. Sorry, uh, if someone want to, I'll, I'll, I'll move to approve. Oh, sorry. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is there cut cupcakes that come with this or something? Yeah. <laughs> it's our first one, right? Or something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> David, did you bring cupcakes? I brought something for you, Mike. <laughs> it's not quite tomatoes. cupcakes, but it's your tomato order. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than cupcakes. Oh, wow. It's easy. It's delivering all the jealous. It's funny. I think I... I Tasia you, uh, texted me, I think. It must be my tomatoes. Yes, she said yours <laughs> earlier. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, thank you, Lord. Mr. Ruff, I have your tomatoes. <laughs> I wasn't able to check it until now. I had an excuse. So moving to 7.5.1, uh, whereby we're asked to uh, review, update, and adopt the board policy with respect to extracurricular and co-curricular activities. That's right. So this is, uh, again, just a reminder to the board and information for the audience. This is an item that uh, was approved, or the board policy was approved back in 2013. Uh, as part of the policy, we are to review it annually, and so it came to you in uh, January initially, and then we've had some subsequent conversation, including this being the uh, immediately precipitating event for last month's conversation around Nordoff grading of extracurriculars and other activities. Uh, it is the uh, Nordoff administration, as well as mine, that we uh, um, not make modification to the board policy at this time, um, but we are formally, as the, the board policy uh, requires, uh, uh, want to allow the board to review and uh, uh, we can document that in the minutes. We tried to ask as many questions as we could, Kevin, last mm -hmm. month without you here for that conversation. Well, so one thing I think I could confirm is that they are able at Nordoff and are now calculating GPAs manually to account for that anomaly of these, you know, additional grades that are um, along with the weighted AP grades. There's actually four different grades okay. that grade point averages that they put on the transcript and then also they manually grade things when it comes to other things like top seniors and stuff like that so I think that's what we're talking about I mean right. to be on the clear clear about it because it yeah. hasn't really been that clear and it hasn't necessarily <laughs> even happened and I think in fairness that a student the one who brought it to our attention in the first place Jesse I think they even had to kind of fix it yet yeah, it, but they finally got it right now I think I don't know if you know about it but I think he's going to be uh, he's going to be the coast, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But I think he was not identified up until you know there was some additional. We did uh, we did make sure that he received uh, credit for his summer school college class. Oh, that was that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Were there fewer top seniors this year than last year? It seemed like that to me. There were ten total on the list that I saw. So uh, last year, I think there were 13. Um, we, did, we used to call this the top 10 or use you know, different terms like that. And it was a, a few years back that the administration really wanted to not restrict itself to only 10, but instead look at you know, kind of that clear grouping of who were those top, you know, top seniors. And if there was an 11th or 12th who really belonged up in that group, we didn't want to you know, have that child or that student not feel recognized and honored. And so we do change the number each year based on the, you know, that year's cohort. So I think you are right that this year is a few lower than last year. But I, but I mean, we should highlight it at some point in our PR. I think they've done amazingly well in college, uh, college acceptance. I mean, they've got a whole bunch of, they've got five Berkeley, I think. Mm -hmm. They've got UCLA, multiple, they've got all sorts of Cal Poly, um, really amazing. That's great. <coughs> um, I, mean, I, I, I don't have many more, I, you know, I think of my questions on these things have been answered. I mean, I think one of the things that's unfortunate is, you know, I've always felt like sports really could be a way for a kid who's otherwise not doing well to kind of have a reason for being connected to school. And so when a school kind of makes that, hey, you don't have that 2.0, you're gone, see ya, what often happens is they just end up disconnecting from the school and you, they're pretty much that's it that's that's the you know kind of the 
a fork in the road for them, and they never really are, you know, they get older and they maybe drop out of high school, whatever. That said, you know, I mean, obviously, you, you, maybe even CIF has standards, I don't, you know, that supersede anything that we would do, but, you know, I just wish there were a way along the lines of what we were talking about with, you know, early sleep or, or later sleep, et cetera, you know, to fashion things more specific. Yeah, unfortunately, CIF does have, is the one that does identify the 2.0 yeah. uh, GPA uh, requirement. You know, I, I agree with you. You know, obviously one of our greatest priorities in offering any extracurricular is really to help that student build a connection to the school and help give them reasons of motivation and, uh, you know, the positive morale that comes from being part of the team. And, you know, many of those things that really all tie back into ultimately academic success and connection and, you know, staying at the school. Uh, the challenge is, I agree with you that, you know, we, we might have one of those kids who are in that, you know, uh, zone of being on the bubble that if they fall below the 2.0, they may end up, that may be one of the precipitating events that keep them down that path. Although by having that uh, um, requirement, it ends up, I can't tell you how many, you know, the number of students that we have that, but for that requirement, they would be perfectly content being 1.0 students or, you know, whatever it might be. And so that ends up being one more barometer to help them really to, you know, achieve. And so it is kind of a double-edged sword or challenge. Yeah. You know, it would be interesting if we could combine, you know, obviously a lot of information about college sports with our students at the academy. And all, well, actually, any tour you go on, they're going to tell you about the support their athletes have. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they have uh, academic support for athletes. And it'd be interesting to see if we could somehow <coughs> longer library hours get some kind of a, you know, if you have a group of students who are on the cusp of losing their sport, right. to right. maybe say, hey, you, you're going to miss one practice in order to go to, or I don't know how it would mm -hmm. work, but maybe, you know, the indi that individual idea, maybe, because maybe, I don't know how many students it is, I don't think it's that many. But it'd be interesting to see if somehow, maybe with an OEF grant or something, that we could support some athletes by incorporating it into the, the extra library hours. Or mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not asking you to ask somebody and write it down. I'm just. It's written down. Uh, yeah, I don't mean. I want action on this. It just makes yeah, you think. Right. That you, mm -hmm. Ideas. And again, it's. How many you know, I noticed this. Um, pro oh, sorry. This probationary semester here on uh, 306, mm -hmm. is that statutory? <coughs> it is to one semester, and I'll say that that's something that uh, we just reviewed at Nordoff this year because the historical precedent is that we, we do not have a, or we have a local practice of not utilizing uh, that probationary semester. Really? Because um, that seems very responsive to what Jane and Kevin are talking about. I agree, and that's exactly the, the conversations that are taking place right now. Cool. So, so while we're, we are, or have been throughout the year. So while we're adopting the pre, this is the pre-existing policy. Correct. Correct. We're hopeful that that our execution of the policy will be more flexible. Would that be fair? Understood. That's cool. very clear guidance from the board. Well, and I you and, know, and I a kept, very clear priority for me. I yeah, hope. I kept. On page five of six, this number one, I, I, I keep getting stuck on that. And, you know, <laughs> it says we're not going to grade them. Why are we grading them? And he said, well, because those aren't extracurricular. So football is not an extracurricular activity, or a band is not, a, you know. But you can choose for it to be an extracurricular. Is that right, by waiving out, by, by waiving. doing the waiver. And, and we've sort of given our thoughts to Andy that just to make sure that that's the experience. That if a student says, "I don't, I don't want to be graded for the play," they don't have to be graded. So. Which you know, which again, I'm sure on the ground is a very un unusual and unlikely thing to happen. But um, I think we've, I think we've all talked this out pretty, <laughs> pretty much to the yeah. end. Lori, did you have a comment? I just, Anna, I had a question. How many students each year are being? Uh, excused from the teams for not hitting that 2.0 GPA. Yeah, I don't know a number. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I kind of think 2.0, if they're not like hitting 2.0, we'd be having support 
you know, that nobody wants to be like a D average star quarterback. You know, like you want them to have there's an, there's some other skills they should be getting and, and support along the way. So and I know a lot of the coaches do send the kids to library after mm -hmm. tutoring, big, yes. to, to tutoring and to and where there's teachers in there. I know volleyball used to have mandatory. Uh, you go do your homework before you come to practice. Uh, I think football. Some of the coaches have had a lot of uh, <coughs> encouragement of the kids to go go get that help. Before coming to and with the new library. And you know, in some Study of sports around. starting to practice later, you know, it could be a more common Absolutely. thing. And I'm sure right. people are really going to dig using that library. Well, and I would kind of argue that any student at 2.0 needs the extra support, not just our athletes. Oh, totally That's agree. just kind of an incentive. Hold it, it's an election year, right? Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just offer some data? Um, uh, from the survey re regarding sleep, um, 6% of the students, 39 total, reported uh, the self-identified in the low GPA category, meaning C's or D's or below, which I think is a 2.0 mm -hmm. or below. Um, they slept 9% less than uh, the rest of the students, less than seven hours. They rated their health as a 2.53, which would be a middle of the fair range, which is 15% below average. And 33% of those 39 kids reported feeling depressed much, much of the time. So I don't know how many of them are athletes. Well, I have to enters, say, but. I have to say that that you know, if we can institutionalize that kind of data collection, and and make it increasingly, you know, who knows how you do this, but try and eliminate the outliers and the people that are just going to fool around with it, but really try to get some buy-in. I mean, it really is an inter interesting way to sort of feel like you can, you know, someone can anonymously t kind of tell them, tell you where they are, and you can look at a picture and really, it says a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. Kevin, um, yeah. There are programs out there. I, we had one at elementary, the student assistance program, but there are programs for high school kids that are used to specifically identify kids that fall into that range, and um, the teachers the teachers identify them, and the kids can self-identify as well. But then there's, there are teams that come together on campus to say, what are we gonna do about this particular student? And they, they make it an effort to touch base with them on a regular basis. They make sure they're getting extra support. Um, they they're, like interact with parents if they need it. There, there are specific programs to do that, and they are highly successful and I cannot remember the name of it right now. So if I find it, I you know I could send it to you guys or you guys. But I I do believe that's out there. And the elementary school ended up with it. Was it was it something that the principal brought to the elementary school? How did the the, the, the student assistant program? Mm -hmm. um, Don Gorman, myself, Chris Ondo. We, we, Dawn, I think, found it, oh, okay. and we went down to the, um, to a week-long workshop, and then brought the program back to Topatopa. We did that for a number of years, and then it sort of dissolved, because we didn't have any kids to fit in it anymore. We had, so, I mean, we, we did our job really well, but we shouldn't have dissolved it, because, just because, it, you know, there's always new kids coming in. Mm. Um, but it, we identify those kids, and when there's a specific program that focuses on academic health, safety, behavior, mm -hmm. and teachers would put those kids into the student assistance program, their name, and then we would make a plan and implement that plan and make sure they got the support they needed. And so. did this happen largely without parental knowledge that their kid was in this program? Or no, how no, did that no. part, that no, part no, no, was, no. so it was a, a comprehensive, mm -hmm. But it could, it technically, because that we were only a, addressing those four mm. areas, we could do it without parental notification. Mm -hmm. But we did ask for parental. We we let parents know that your your child has been identified for blah blah blah. And we're trying to give them support. So, but I found <coughs> that there are programs out there for the high school age, junior high and high school, that are very different than this program. Um, and they're highly successful. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, even even something as, you know, kind of 
beginning stages as, you know, I, I know Asla and I were surprised when Jem started high school because we just hadn't made this mental transition that there were just no, there were no parent-teacher conferences. You know, like there's no, like, how do we know that everything's going normal, you know, unless you, you know, you know, make an effort and reach out and, and do it yourself, you know. And I, even on a smaller level, if you said first semester, you know, first semester, half, you know, two, a third of the way, quarter through, any of the kids who are really struggling, we're going to have conferences. I mean, it's not, you know, the kids aren't too old for that. I mean, parents want to know. Or some too, you know, I'm sure sometimes it's. Well, we've got the, all those parent identification Right? I mean, you, you're well, like a parent connector where you go in and see your yeah, kids' grades yeah. and all that kind of thing. So I think the parents who yeah. are aware are aware. Do all and parents have access to parent connect? Mm -hmm. Do they all have computers at home? Mm -hmm. And is it, is it equitable in terms of which parents can connect and which parents can't? I mean, so I think we're having an excellent conversation on an important topic, but this is going to be uh, one time I throw the Brown Act hat on and say I think that we have gone beyond the scope of the uh, board policies to which we are asking you currently to review. I, I disagree. I, I think this is a consistent with the conversation about what we're doing with our athletics. Um, I, I don't think it's a Brown Act issue. Okay. I have to, uh, one more thing because what Jane brought up, so um, Nan Davis is working with OEF to put together a volunteer database, and they're almost ready to actually have an online um, system where you can say, I uh, have Tuesdays this much time, and you can look and you can see basically her vision is to match what's needed at, in your classroom with very specifics to volunteers who have time. And it's really brilliant, and I think it's going to come in super handy. But we all, so I talked to Nan because we have a whole group of people who approached in our parent association wanting to really mentor and wanting to engage with tutoring, but even go beyond that and really take certain kids <coughs> and help them with uh, individuals who have time and really have that bond go forward, not just helping with homework, but also even maybe possibly with college applications or other things or, you know. So I think all this could really come together and maybe some of it can also be out outsourced by existing programs, but I think, you know, we're small enough, this could be small enough town that this could really work. And I think that, I think in NORDOC there's a real need for that. I mean, not just for athletes, not just for this or that individual, but there are whole groups of kids, I think academically especially, really need support and parents don't really know how to get that support and I don't think that the library, you know, if you're not understanding the math, going there and trying to do your homework is not really helpful and not the student peer tutoring, I think is helpful for some kids but really not enough for others. If there are things missing uh, from previous grade level, it's really hard for somebody to compensate that while they're trying to see if you're learning that particular subject they're struggling with, uh, that lesson. All right, shall we uh, vote on the current policy that's before us? First uh, motion. I'll move to approve the policy DP uh, and AR 145 as presented. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now, um, we're going to discuss 7.5.2, uh, the notion of a, a student advisory council or some other uh, student representative to bring um, student perspective to our board meetings. And I think you're going to, going to defer to yeah, Jane, so who's done I, a lot of work on it. I wrote notes earlier. So this whole sleep review is getting student input, right? And that when Janine was talking about um, the vignettes that the kids were asking for, it was student input. And that for me, it's like, yes, this is what I'm talking about. Not just um, that they would be here and hear what we're talking about and add a voice of you know, their opinion, <coughs> which is valuable. But the idea that um, as 
the program grows. I get it doesn't happen overnight, but as we, if we pick up a, a program that has multiple student representatives who meet once a month and say, well, hey, everybody this month is talking about, you know, gun safety. Are you doing the April 21st thing? You know, blah, 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 blah. Let's talk about it. And is that something that the board needs to discuss? Or is there something that, you know, hey, we really want this program where we have mentors in the high school and the kids would love that idea or um, you know sometimes they'll come and they'll have nothing to talk about and then maybe you know the adult <coughs> monitors the group says well here's the three things they're going to be discussing they're going to be talking about late start times and blah 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 what are your guys' opinions on those things and then as that group the way I pictured it um, there are two different models, and so that's, I think, our point is tonight, is to talk about what kind of model. I think we've all sort of expressed, well, whether we'd like to move forward with the student council, and if so, what kind of model it would be. So, um, the article that you were sent um, from this student representative at the high school in, uh, I think it was Virginia, um, it's just the two reps who meet with the board. I don't. I didn't get the sense that those students were meeting other students or sort of going around the high school and asking for other students' opinions. It was more a chance for the adults at the board to just hear a teen's opinion. Um, but the model that I had researched that was exciting for me was something where the students at the high school know that there is a person their age who's going to be going to the board meetings. And if there is something that they would like us to hear about, this is the person you should go talk to. Because if you just go and say, well, did, you know, you and your parents can write board members anytime you want it. With, or you can write the administration. They're, they're welcome to do that, but I think they're maybe less likely to do it than they might be if there's actually a body, a student body, whose job it is to go around and come up with those, I, those things that students are maybe talking about that they might not think to share about, or share with adults. So, um, I mean, that's where the discussion starts. Do we think we would like sort of a student advisory council? Or, and if so, what? What would we hope from them? Well, I'm. Since everybody's looking at yeah. <laughs> you made a movement. <laughs> oh, did I? Oh, okay. Um, I like the idea of hearing more than just the activities, right? I mean, I, I would really like to hear what students are thinking, and I think it would be valuable for us, especially not to just work in a vacuum, right? And then once you get to high school, Lord knows you're old enough to have opinions. Um, and you know you've been around long enough to know even about elementary stuff too, and and articulate it well. Um, about uh, the structure and all of that, I, I I would personally I prefer to leave that to administration to figure that out, because part of this I think depends on on how many students actually want to do it. Um, so I would be reluctant to <coughs> impose something from the top <coughs> down. Um, Frankly, if the students are going to come here and be representative, I think they're mature enough to figure out how they're going to do that, too. Um, you know, I, I, I would leave it to the students to figure out how do you want to craft this in, in partnership with administration, right? But I like the idea of having people come here and participate in our conversations uh, and bring us information and potentially even new topics to discuss. Uh, like this sleep thing, frankly. I would love to hear from somebody who's actually experiencing it. So I would agree with most everything you said. Um, I think that in order to make it work, it would really need to be structured so that the students know that they're bringing to us either their opinion or they're representing mm -hmm. the student body. Because sitting on that late start committee, you had three students with three different opinions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean right. that that, you know, that they're representing the student body. Right. So I think it needs to be really clear which one they're doing. I agree. I, I think that's a good. That's a good. Mm -hmm. that's a good point. I also think um, 
because Andy and I had some conversations about it that um, because of you know right now we have this rep and we have the leadership class and we and their student government what are they called the elected the ASB the, the, the what are they, are they ASB they're not, but they're just leadership class at Norda. Yeah, but they're elected. Well, it's leadership class, but, but then within that, there's... they're elected by the leadership class. Oh, they're not by elected the student by the student oh, okay. body. So it, it just got confusing. So, you know, Andy was like, what, you know, you guys need to be specific about what you right. are looking for to know how it, it would run. And that's why I got, I, I personally got the, uh, the feeling that it would be, you know, we can, if we set something and try that, it doesn't work. And the administration says, you know, it might work better if you do this. But I feel I felt like we needed to at least, you know, make the make the box and figure out how we move in and out of that, rather than just say we want to rep. You guys figure it out. I mean, am I? Yeah, I think that you know we've had some really good conversations around this table the past few months <coughs> on this topic. And I think that the, one of the challenges we face is when we were trying to look at the whatever role this, or however this position may come about, of um, having it be the class president or having it be the student body president or whatever it might be because of the, you know, really the unique role that that position uh, has within the context of uh, leadership and the, you know, student government functions of approving ASB accounts and uh, allowing a check to be sent to the DJ for the upcoming dance and you know different things like that when it comes to the actual student government plus planning activities that uh, it sounded like we were facing some challenges and uh, when we were trying to create something new but still fit it into that box and so that's I think Jane I appreciate this uh, this concept I would be in support of it um, and the uh, the idea though is that we really do divorce the two things of you know, student government through the leadership class at uh, Nordoff is distinct from the uh, way in which we try to engage students at this board level. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a board liaison is right. different than a class president. Exactly, yeah, exactly. No, I, I think that makes perfect sense. One, one of the things you brought up uh, at some point, Jane, I thought was the prospect of the board just holding interviews you know, sort of making the position available and then, and then having interviews. I, I kind of overall feel like this is a board thing and we should, I don't think, and, you know, unless we got intelligence from Andy or Cheryl that there was some offense being taken uh, at, at, at high, the high school, I would just assume that the administration of the high school would think, yeah, you know, do whatever you guys want to do, you know, have, have a, I mean, I, I kind of feel like it's, it's more of a, fun, you know, make it known that we're looking essentially for somebody who's going to be the board rep from the high school. Kind of figure out whether we really think it's realistic to expect them to be here every, you know, board meeting for the whole meeting, which I don't think would be a reasonable expectation, but maybe we would. But, but nevertheless, that this is a person who's representing the students at the board. And... Um, you know, I, I mean, you never know. Maybe, maybe there would be no one interested. Maybe there would be several people interested. But, but it kind of feels to me like what we're looking for is a direct con connection. We're not looking for something mediated through the administration of Nordoff. We would have that. What we want is literally, we want to hear it from the streets, you know. And I think to do that, we would have to just go out and say we're going to have interviews and we want a board representative and we're going to hear what you have to say and, and, and consider what you have to, to say about it. My one concern, I, 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 I agree with that. Um, my thought in terms of these meetings and the length of them and meeting once a month, um, like this, this school in Virginia has two different reps, so they would really be doing it once a month, which would be a lot easier. Um, so then I thought, well, then do you do that, that sort of idea of a junior and a senior? And then I thought, well, what if you have a board rep, a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, maybe somebody from Chaparral, and they 
they either meet or whatever, but only one of either the junior or the senior or the Nordoff and the <coughs> only those two, you wouldn't have a freshman come and sit on, at the board. You would have only the upperclassmen. Mm -hmm. But you would still be able to hear because would would the seniors know what's happening at the freshman level now that there's freshman physics or I don't you know you know I mean things have changed since already since they were freshmen <coughs> so it you know and again we might not we might not have any freshmen that are interested in it and we as a board might decide no that's too complicated let's just have these two reps and you know. Talk to them about how we hope that they'll reach out to the school, to the student body, to get information. I don't know how they would do that if um, if they were just, you know, like one of them applied and we chose that one person. And I don't really know. We'd have to work through that. But um, I got the sense from from this school in Virginia that it it turned out that. Um, you know, the students were sort of, let's, I mean, we haven't discussed this, but let's say we had an um, uprising of families who wanted to talk about the dress code. And so we had a big meeting about the dress code, and then we, oh, I haven't heard this, so I'm, I just picked that. Um, and we came to a decision. It would be really, I think, helpful for that student to not only know what we talked about, but be able to get the word out that this is why they made that decision. You know, whether he or she agrees with it or not, at least they're part of the conversation and we're hearing, you know, kind of like that sixth grade committee. Those kids, whatever, each of them, they didn't all get sort of what they wanted <laughs> out of the meeting, but they <clears throat> came back to the school <throat> with knowledge. To me, that, uh, that Shelley asked a fundamental question, which is, why are they here, right? Either because we want to hear from a kid, oh, kiddo, or because they're speaking for many as a representative, right? I mean, and, and uh, either one has value, right? If we just want to talk to a high school student or, or like you're discussing, somebody who's actually sort of known as someone who'll be here who can gather opinions and talk to us m about more than just what that individual thinks. Um, but if we go down the representative road, I get a real, I get a little, maybe it's just because I deal with unions all the time, but I get a, a little nervous about picking people's representatives. Um, so I, to me, it would be helpful to know what is it specifically that we want the body for. Um, in, in my opinion, I think, you know, as a representative is actually more useful if it's feasible. <coughs> But then you should be elected. I think so. Well, selected, elected, somehow. I think it's more meaningful, right, for me as a student to pick somebody that I'm comfortable talking to versus maybe somebody I'm not. Can I ask something and say something? I don't know if this is going to be the open bar. But I think one of the issues with having one person is that that person is very unlikely to be involved in all the different aspects at NORA. And I think maybe that liaison is in charge of inviting different people from different groups. Like if they're not taking art as an elective, they have no idea what's going on in the art department or in the music department or if they're not involved in sports or if they're not a certain class. But maybe their job is to sort of bring forward things that are going on. And if, for example, we had a massive art show, then maybe some kids from ceramics come and talk about that. Because I think you, you, you want to hear about different things and different aspects of the school. And uh, maybe the format is both where there is a liaison and the liaison <coughs> gets people who want to come and present or talk to you guys. And if there's this issue that is happening, maybe then they select somebody who wants to talk about the issue. But there's sort of an ongoing group of people. So you might be hearing from the Interact Club, they're doing something, the girls and the kids are going to Costa Rica, you know, the band kids are preparing for something, and I mean. Except for me, that enough. starts to represent what this person doing, which is just telling us what's going on, which is what we we want, we sort of want to know, and we're, we've been talking, I've been talking to Andy too, about how do we get this sort of, like, you know, having gone to the OEF 
grant. It's like, we need to tell people about these things. Mm -hmm. How do we get this out? And this was sort of one of the, have somebody come and talk about it. But I mean, we know that exposure is limited. I mean, there's six people in the room, maybe 10 people watch li live or recorded. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> I, I, just, I, don't, I don't feel that that's as useful as, um, you know, sure, I want, I want to find out that, you know, the volleyball team went to playoffs or things like that. No, I, I don't mean they report to you. They bring somebody from whatever that here. So then that kid talks to you. So <coughs> recording and be inviting. Right. Like I'll be inviting the like six kids who went to the, or the four kids who went to the math competition. Annika, you seem like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to articulate it. Um, I love the sound of this. This was, of all the things I picked up when I was back there, that's the one I picked up. I'm like, ooh, student representation, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I have a dress code agenda, <coughs> but I'm not bringing it on this occasion. Um, but to me, that like dress code is kind of like the most grounded concern that every single student, you know, rubs against. And uh, at some point or later, you know, sooner or later, um, but do you guys go to the campuses? Does the board members, like, like if, it, if what you're seeking is just like, tell us, <coughs> tell us like, do, is there, I, I'm just thinking, why not you guys go to the campuses and hold office hours? Like, go to lunch, I don't know. I'm, we do, but I mean, it, uh, it's more for events. Uh, you know, we go to the plays, we go to the concerts, yeah, we go I mean, to the go games. To I have my little thing, Once a nobody. Month, would kids come talk to you? I had the same, I actually Would pitched they? that idea that yeah. we have like kind of a, a couple a of representatives and go and say, hey, your board members are here. I could, I could Town find a whole style. bunch of kids that would love to talk to you about the dress code. <laughs> 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 but I mean, you know, that's a current topic. But um, we also have members that aren't available during the day to do that. And then that becomes... <coughs> I don't know. It is I mean, it'd be a great opportunity for a kid who had that drive and motivation and focus and to be able to come and sit here and transfer this experience to their future. I, I, I would just say it, when the board used to come to Tokotoka and sit in the staff room, I was the only one who would really talk to anybody. I mean, there were a few of us. So that's mm -hmm. teachers, mm -hmm. right? And adults <laughs> talking to other adults. And there's a few of us, maybe, but really everybody just avoided the staff room. <laughs> oh, no, it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, can't you relax? <laughs> yeah, during the election, I made a couple yeah. of those. Yeah. That was, so, didn't, yeah, four you know, people. I'm just, one, I, I'm, I'm just thinking you're going to go, you're going to spend your lunch hour or a, a, an afternoon hanging out, and you're going to hang out, and you're not, I just can't. Kids don't even know yet my how daughter. to interact with yeah. 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 Express, well, except something. their parents to express <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's kind of why, why, in my view, maybe it's a person. I mean, here the, the concern is that it becomes a dud, right? I mean, that would be that, that you end up with this person and they're like, I don't, you know, I'm busy, you know, uh, this month I got nothing, you know, and, and then it becomes like, what, what, you know, should we be pulling it out of people more? Should we be, should we be, um, you know, kind of creating in each agenda, some issue, some question, some some desire, you know? Are we unrealistic to think that, that there would be a, a rep who would come? I mean, I think if you have the right person, I think you could have that. You, you could have a person that would show up, you know, for lack of a better word, full of piss and vinegar and have, every time, like have stuff that they want to talk about. I mean, it's interesting, I believe there's a school walkout having, happening nationwide on Friday, I believe, right? We have heard nothing about it, you know, I think, so right? The 20th, 20th? isn't 420? And, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just be interest. you know, just, but I don't know, I don't know the answer. I mean, Manassas got a great result. But well, I think that's why I had that feel, that sense of it needs to be a group. You know, you have four, at least four reps, one from each class who meet, and because you, you're more likely to get one who's heard something that month that they can discuss. Or, you know, um, 
find somebody who's available who wants to come speak rather than just a board rep. Mm -hmm. It would be a advisory council. So the council would be one person from each class at Nordoff and a person from Chaparral. And the council would <coughs> be about issues that the students are having or about issues that have been expressed to them by their teachers or their parents or our board, like, you know, something they heard us talk about the last meeting or something. So that you're, and then F, when you have an advisory council, are they someone who's recognized at the rally? So they would say on Friday, hey, I'm going to a meeting next month. Don't forget, I stand out uh, on Wednesday at snack and have a little table and if you want to come talk or our freshmen go here and talk to their, I don't know. It just it seems like it's going to be a slow beginning, but I think if you have a council versus a rep, that it, it would work better for us. That's just my opinion. Well, maybe one way to bring it to a head is for the board members themselves to sort of consider and then maybe make their own suggestions that could all be consolidated so that we could discuss specific options the next time and make a choice. I mean, this is not an action item, obviously, right, so the question right. is how do we bring this to a head? Well, I could, um, I could sort of, you know, make a you know, please in your comments address these three things. Would it be a single rep? Would it be a council? Would they be elected? Would they be appointed? Would they uh, come to every, you know, sort of give you, please address some of these things when you write to Andy so that he can come to it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if we're, we're talking apples and oranges, how does, he, how does he sort of bring it together and make it an opinion? If we had a committee, I'm assuming, I'm thinking, um, they could meet during that tutorial hour, if that works, um, that they call at Matillaha tutorial, right? What is it at Nordoff? You know what I mean? Advisory? What is it? Collaboration? Pardon? Tutorial. Anyway. Is tutorial also <laughs> Thursday? <laughs> um, <coughs> I think it might be called seminar. Seminar. Anyway. But an adult would need to be part of that, and I think that's really where you're going to get this off the ground or not is is there leadership for that group if we were to go the group route have we talked to counselors at Nordoff or do you envision a teacher um, I was at I was I think I mentioned to Kevin member. one of my um, ideas was that it would be a board member but it would be in the evening you know it would be like a Thursday night before the agenda meeting or something but again you're right then you're going to get into more um, you know I'm more than conflicts. willing to to volunteer to to be the the moderator next year and to meet during a seminar on Thursdays or Fridays or whatever that is and see we could certainly revisit after a year and say well that didn't work you know <laughs> uh, or, or it, it did. did, now what? Because Jane doesn't want to do it for eight years. Or, you know, <laughs> or maybe I do. Maybe it's exciting. And, I, think it, that, I think your willingness to do I think that would be awesome. Absolutely. I mean, I think you really, that would, offering that, for some students, that would be really awesome. And you have no kids there to humiliate, so it's all good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more, Jane. Also, I almost think together with Matilla Hall, because I think if you have kids at Matilla Hall coming to Norab knowing this is a possibility, and it's going to be almost like a seamless transition because they really enjoy it, they'll keep doing it. So knowing at Matoha this is something that's a possibility <coughs> when they're then in the they already know how it is. I agree. I would love to include them. I just don't know if it's during the school day. Then what, then how do we do that? How do we get them from Matilha? Well, maybe Matilha. they also have a representative, but maybe that's they alternate or they come every third month. I don't know. But I mean, I think at least to put the seed at Matilha that this is something that the board does. And then... I think it's, establishing it at Nordoff with the intention of expanding it would be the best option. Make sure you have a pilot program that's working and then get Matilla and Chaparral involved. I think it's really, what I love about the idea of, it's sort of like a seminar class with an outside professional, you know, to, who, who's in this case on a working elected board mm -hmm. to talk about 
the kinds of things that the students could engage in it, I think, I think that's really awesome. So Jane, thank you for volunteering yourself. Well, that, that's uh, which, the which best idea that? I've heard so far. Was was that also an announcement of your re-election campaign? So yeah, I guess so. Oh, gosh, I didn't think about that. I'm up for re-election. Yeah, what happens if I'm not re-elected? Well, you've locked it in. Wait, always here and then find your out. If I decide to run, my campaign slogan would be, vote for me, but if you have to, vote for Jane first. Because she's got the seminar. Trust me, it's an important thing. Footnote. So um, I will send out a communication to you guys before the next board meeting to solicit feedback. And then as part of the, uh, the next agenda, I will give a, a menu of options, maybe you know, try to get a uh, consensus around what I think would be two potential concepts and then allow for the board to engage in that conversation uh, next meeting. Cool. At what point do we involve administration at Nordoff? After oh. we've made our decisions to heck with them? <laughs> All right. Well, they're, I mean, okay. Cheryl said, well aware that yeah, you are seeking something yeah, like okay. this. Yeah. yeah, Cheryl's had multiple conversations with them on this topic. Yeah, and they, obviously we would need their okay to do it during the seminar time. And right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think it, they Have probably should be told right now, now that we're thinking of this to see if they see any immediate well, impediment. I guess my, my point won't. was if we have two models of what it looks like, I would want input from the school as to what they thought of those okay. models. Mm -hmm. We'll be sure to include that. Cool. Moving to uh, 7.5.3, um, this is the discussion of board be member benefits and um, so this is something that's been sort of percolating for, you know, essentially since I've been on the board. Um, I thought that this should be formally looked at before the next election so that we can at least uh, I know that the last board had looked at this in a formal way and had gathered information, and I think it's appropriate to do that again. Um, you know, the financial condition of the school district is always changing. Um, and I'd, I'd like to bring it to a, you know, ultimately to, a, to an action item that, where we decide, you know, whether and what board benefits we want to offer. So I had a question because I was reading through this and I got to the part that says, well, you know, you get a stipend or we pay the premiums. The premiums are a lot higher than the stipend. <laughs> <laughs> and Correct. so how do we get that disconnect? I, I have an answer. I, I think it's because it is a historical anomaly that back at some point that was, they were, they were, oh, you know, the relatively, for that cheap. yeah. <laughs> and then the benefits How became. How long ago was that? Yeah. <laughs> but truly, you know, I mean, I remember when I, uh, I was at a law firm and left in the early '90s um, to become an actor. It didn't work out. But you know, then I went on the Cobra, and I was paying something like four hundred dollars a month for full everything. So, um, or even less, maybe. One fifty. I remember. Yeah. Like, you know, when I come to think of it. I was being so. an independent <laughs> consultant back in the 80s. It cost me $500 a month hmm. yeah, for, for full blue crops. You're also three years younger. Excuse me? <laughs> was there a question pending? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, think, I think that there are, there are, you know, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I mean, it can be, there, we, we could say, you know, being a board member is not truly a full time job, so maybe you know, half benefits, you know, half pay. Um, well, I think it's important, you know, to actually <coughs> say here. So right now, our stipend is two hundred and forty dollars a month, or sixteen thousand dollars a year. It doesn't say that. It's actually more than that, right? Isn't it like twenty grand now? Well, it. Uh, I believe for board member benefits that you are exp um, have the opportunity for the tiered rate structure. So if it is a full family, then it would be in excess of twenty thousand. Um, the the blended rate that our employees receive is the sixteen thousand dollar number that you're referencing. But right. for for board so members, if they have dependents, um, then they would be twenty two thousand or so. Uh, or if they have multiple dependents, full family. If it's only one person, then it would be there. So if there's five members who are getting the benefit, the health benefit, it's equivalent to what percent of say a, a teacher in a classroom? 
If we had all five board members receiving benefits, let's just go to the most extreme scenario. All five board members receiving benefits and all five having full family on the coverage, um, that would be in excess of $100,000. A brand new starring teacher with uh, all statutory costs and everything is about 75000 So it would be uh, about <coughs> 1.4 FTE. So a full-time teacher plus two more sections at a secondary level. And so, again, what is the, I'm going to be sorry I asked this, but what's really the point here? What, we, what is, the, what, I mean, why do we do this? Offer full benefits and, and that. I mean, I mean, I've watched the council go through their thing and talk about <laughs> diversity and all that stuff, but this is not, you know, this is not a substitute for a, a job or a living. So why do we offer board full benefits essentially free? Well, the most direct answer is because a prior board made that decision, which is, okay, why, this, that which is why this board has the ability to make an alternative decision. But I do think that there is uh, um, a level of truth in what the board or what the council is, has been going through recently. Uh, for those who haven't seen the most recent OVN, they, they are looking at approving a nearly uh, a doubling of their current compensation um, but part of it is that, you know, when you talk about the number of, I know how many hours you guys put into this and I don't know if the public does realize it, but <coughs> it does take significant time and that if we want to encourage diversity, if we want to encourage someone who might be, doesn't have the flexibility to maintain a full-time job at hours at their discretion and still do this, that this does help free them up to have a little more flexibility. Um, that, you know, I, I don't think that even with giving you full, uh, benefits that does actually, give you even minimum wage on a compensation level for the hours that you guys are putting into this. But, um, but I think that that's the rationale is that one, as some level of uh, remuneration for the many hours you guys are putting in, but also to potentially um, uh, not be left with a, a dearth of potential candidates that are less than the quality that we desire to pursue this position. So they would do it for the insurance? I think that's the, the rationale is that there may be members who uh, pursue the, the position and or remain on the, the, in the position uh, because that does help them significantly. Uh, and so that could be a, a good argument for uh, maintaining benefits or it may like be something said, to, then to then question if that's not. Are they serving for the right purpose? Are they actually serving? I think in ways they, that they are, that that would be or could be. A person who there's something about paying somebody to do a job then they do it better than if you just ask them to do it for nothing people put more effort into it if they're getting something in return so I think that that it's valid to um, to offer some kind of remuneration and there are people who you know while this isn't a full-time job and um, benefits come with a full-time job and you ask the question, you know, is this the same as, I can't remember how you said it now. Um, <laughs> um, replacing a full-time job, like could this replace, there are those of us out there who lived many years without insurance and we're putting all that volunteer work into a school and if you do it here, you're, you could, or, you know, the way, um, who is it, Somas has a 50-50 where you couldn't go out on the market and buy right. that, that this would be a way to, to put in your volunteer hours and do what you want for your school district and <coughs> be able to afford health insurance. 50-50, that would be, I mean, 50-50 would be, in that situation, 10, 10 grand, which somebody is, is regular insurance more than that, like the, the option for, because I'm part of a group plan. So it probably I is. I mean, I think we get a pretty good deal, right? I mean, our insurance, we think, is pretty good. Or, no, well, no, if you were an individual you saying, well, out there. No, that's I what I'm saying. I think it's cheaper here. You're saying as compared to like Covered California? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I only know one plan in particular with Covered California, so I don't know how our current plan here stacks up with them. I would assume that our rate pool is more attractive for an insurer than the Covered California uh, uh, risk pool. And so I would assume that, 
and we're also a self-funded, you know, uh, agency. So I, I do think that our rates are competitive, very competitive. And again, you know, I remember Kevin when you ran years and years ago. Um, the time I lost, you can say it. <laughs> a few years, last time, two times ago. Um, we refer, we, we, we refer in my family, we call it the dark days. <laughs> <laughs> but you were, you were running against Linda, and she said, you know, when she broke it down, it was she was earning, you know, like three or four dollars an hour through the insurance, and she felt that she was worth it. And that the job was, you know, that she was committing to the job, and that it, you know, it was a good value for her and for the school district. But we're in a different position financially now than we were, you know, eight years ago or 10 years ago, like maybe 25 years ago when they put this in. So when I look at the value for <coughs> a member to have insurance or to have another teacher, a full-time FTE perhaps, I, I, that's what I'm weighing it against. Not whether this person, this body, has that value. Yes, they, they have the value, but do they have more value than a teacher in the classroom? Because that's what I'm, yeah. I'd be voting against. I, I, you know, from my perspective, uh, I think there are arguments on both sides, no question. But, um, and this is not, you know, this is just a discussion. And actually, I was you know, going to say, I know that Thane would want to, you know, robustly participate in this conversation. So maybe we should, you know, make this a shorter one and then come back to Andy where we can each tell him, you know, maybe data points that we might be interested in getting, you know, like some of the statistics, things like that, in order to have it on the agenda for a vote. But so I, th I think clearly there is some ability to attract talent through offering some compensation. There's no question, I think. But I, from my perspective, we're different than the city because the city can kind of eat what it kills. I mean, they, they can tax whatever they need, and if the people don't like what they're doing, they can throw the bums out. But we live off of what we get through the state, and we have these very limited resources. And so the question is, you know, is it a better, like if we had no benefits today, would we sit around and say, you know, guys, we need better board members, so let's start offering, you know, compensation we probably wouldn't but you know maybe maybe we I, I don't know you know it's funny it's just like with the idea of what we're gonna get when we uh, ask for a board wrap it's possible that some people you know that you know there, there are there is more motivation <coughs> relating to the compensation but I but I also know and Shelly kind of alluded it to it there are a lot of people that do a lot of work in our district for free you know there are a lot and, and that's again different than a city you know the city doesn't have a whole bunch of people out there just doing stuff for the city for free. The city typically pays for the stuff that people do for the city. Um, so, you know, then I really ask myself, well, we're going into this era when we, um, when we are, and by the way, the, 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 you know, my idea, and I think legally speaking, this is going forward. This would be from the coming election onward. Um, you know, is, is it worth, you know, those limited resources, is it worth that extra teacher, that extra whatever it is that we can do with those the resources? Um, is that a question, though, that should be asked by the voters? I know when I was running, it was asked of me specifically, <coughs> will you accept the um, insurance or will you be declining that? And that you know, is, is a valid question to ask your representatives what they're going to do individually. Well, it's a board policy. I mean, I think it's something I, I want to vote on it. I, I don't think that the average voter even knows that we get benefits, honestly. I started asking people that question. Yeah, do, you, I, do you know yeah, what we I, get? I, do you I, know if we get anything? I've gotten very mixed answers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is common that public office holders get benefits <laughs> at the county. <clears throat> um, our trustees get them. Um, I think most school boards have them. Um, so it's not like we're an outlier in doing it. But we are poor, and we're, I think, well, I won't say poor. We are, we have less cash <laughs> than almost everybody else in the county. Um, and so I think that does put us in sort of a special position. But, you know, maybe there's a, maybe there's a middle ground. Maybe at this point we mitigate it and see what happens. Um, 
that maybe it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I mean, my initial thing, though, was like, okay, there's less than $300 on this side, and there's thousands on this side. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I don't have a philosophical objection to, to office holders, and, and I would, in my own mind, I do draw a distinction between a job and an office. Um, you know, we all ran for these, and nobody put a gun to our head, for the most part. Um, so we all kind of knew what we were getting into. You know, a job is different, right? Um, you want to retain employees, uh, because turnover is expensive, but turnover here is a voter decision. <coughs> so it's not always up to us. Uh -uh. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of torn. Um, yeah, I guess that's why I uh, just stuck. And your three hundred dollar a month stipend it gets taxed too. Oh yes, yeah, so it's even less than that. <laughs> so it's not really even three hundred dollars. So, so does my suggestion sound like a good way to take this forward? Um, to to an action item. So the, the current information that we have is that 70% of districts in Ventura <coughs> County uh, do currently offer <coughs> benefits as an option for their board members to receive. But full benefits or? Um, the benefits, oh, uh, yeah, so that, right. So the, the first paragraph, or the paragraph on here, we identify there's 14 school districts, or 14 LEAs out of 20 in the county that offer whatever the same thing employees get, board members get as an option for benefits. However, there are six districts who do something different. Of those six, five, uh, four of which are very small districts, uh, and uh, one is Simi Valley Unified, do not give board members the opportunity to elect benefits at all. And then SOMIS offers the 50-50 the split where um, uh, board members, if they elect to receive the, the benefit, have to contribute uh, an equal share to the district. So that's the, the local information. So no question Michael's accurate that it is very much, you know, standard within the county. And I believe that this information would play out across state as well. Um, however, I certainly also, you know, this is completely uh, your guys' decision. And so let me know what other information, you know, would be helpful for you in, uh, in ultimately arriving at a decision. So what I'd like to do is continue the discussion to the next meeting where Thane can be a, a participant. Uh, and then we can talk about what, um, what the action item would look like. Maybe it would be alternatives. Mm -hmm. you know, so that it would be you know, choose among the following. Continue as, as we are, uh, offer half, or eliminate. But I think Thane should be able to participate in that. And maybe in the meantime, people will have a different, you know, other suggestions as well. And I'd be curious to know if an individual went out on their own to try and purchase <coughs> insurance, how much that actually is in comparison to what we're offering. Uh, I know that I won't be able to find the same policy we have. Uh, CISC doesn't even publish our current policy right. because we are in a grandfathered in uh, so level of coverage. Apples to oranges. Right. Well, not necessarily, right? Because what you're asking is, if you wanted any insurance at all and we didn't offer it, what would it cost you? Right, right? that's Even true. Even if it's an 80-20 plan versus the 90-10. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that would be That is your yeah. option, or the school district is your, you know. Right. Those, that's right. true. I think it would still be interesting. OK. Any further discussion? You want to move on? We'll move on. So Andy, superintendent's report. Yeah, this will. <laughs> Be a brief one again as we look at the clock. Uh, you know, I do uh, feel often that this time of year we end up focusing on some negativity between looking at the budget for next year, looking at our enrollment projections and the impact that it has on staffing, the need to make uh, very, very challenging reductions. However, I do want to just celebrate for a moment. I hope you guys, uh, I'm confident you did, since uh, you know just how dynamic both of the, the women up uh, at the podium earlier this evening are, Janine and Carly, uh, two incredible staff that we have. But really, what stuck out to me as I was hearing Carly speak, I learned a number of things through the process of having this as an agenda item. When I went through as a student and worked at Moore Park High School, we had one counselor for every 600 students. It was a 2,400 student high school. There's four counselors. 
Uh, students met with their counselor once, maybe twice a year, and that was to review their transcript uh, if they were applying to colleges or it was to help with potential uh, selection of classes for the upcoming year. The fact that we do have the incredible counselors that we have, but also the ratios, do allow for something very special and unique that takes place not just at Nordoff, because it really happens across our district with the lower sizes of our schools and the relationships that are able to be formed uh, with the adults there and the students. But um, I just wanted to, to highlight, uh, you know, what at times does create challenges. Certainly our, our declining enrollment does create many challenges, but there are also some really uh, many things that make our, our district and uh, specifically Nordoff really special because of the smaller uh, cohort size that does make it far more akin to the uh, private schools that we, um, you know, share this valley with. But um, I just, that's my brief comment for tonight is uh, just how lucky we are to have both the staff as well as the ratios in some of our uh, sites uh, as a smaller district. Any board commentary or reporting? Well, we have this parking lot. Are we going to talk about that? That would be um, next time as a future agenda. Okay. Yeah, the parking lot is future agenda. Well, Any uh, before I, on, the, I, on the agenda, it's listed it? first. It's not board member report. It's discussion on board member. Oh no, it's not. All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing. You're, 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 even, you're even old enough to know who Emily Latella is. Remember uh -uh. SNL? Oh, yeah. What's all know. this about? Oh, yeah. No, that's violins not. That was um, yeah. violins in school. Yeah. I think violins are good. Okay, well, was that was her name? Yeah, Emily Latella. Um, <laughs> me too. Uh, I just want to reiterate what I brought up before, which is I think we've had a, it sounds like a really amazing ed college admission season at Nordoff. And I'm really proud of the school and proud of the students. And, uh, and hopefully we can highlight that as, uh, as a uh, you know, part of our, our messaging for our very excellent unified school district. Anyone else? I think I'm confused as to what a board um, report is versus future agenda items. Since it's, I'm always thinking, well, what do I want on future agenda it items? It was my design to make, uh, to give a board member more of a, an opportunity like we give our superintendent to sort of Do my soliloquy. Comment, uh, <laughs> you know, discuss, reminisce. Make the length of the... Yeah. <laughs> got it, okay. We still got ideas to we, go. We, yeah, we could go for a long time. Um, it was just the idea that, that we didn't have to be constrained to say, this is something I want a future agenda, but we could merely comment about things or, you know, it's a little more free form. I don't really have anything to add. I only have But now that you know that, <laughs> now that you know that, next time you're going to come loaded for bear. I will come with a long list. All right, to the parking lot. Well, did you have anything? Okay. Oh, she wants to talk about the parking lot. <laughs> but for those uh, in the audience, our parking lot is a new concept. I can't remember who, uh, who whose idea was, it was, but uh, I'll take credit. I don't think it was me. I think it was really a uh, Andy. collaborative. But it's oh no, because Michael Andy? Mike Michael told us that the con that I. I you think guys you have it, right? The phrase, right? Yeah, yeah, it's your we phrase. Did. But yeah. it's it's the idea that you come up with these ideas. And then you talk about them, and then they, you, you don't know what happened to them. So we're now formalizing the idea of those kinds of issues that are discussed at board meetings then find themselves on a parking lot. And we decide as we go along, does that, should that stay there? Should we make, put it on a coming agenda, or should we eliminate it, or what have you? So here's our first discussion of the parking lot. <laughs> so <coughs> this is the first discussion. This is the first time that it's been included in the packet. Uh, the way in which we tried to begin this, and this is just the beginning point, was to actually go back and look at prior minutes and prior meetings and identify <coughs> things that have come up in the board meeting um, that felt like they are things worthy of the parking lot to be able to then bring back and ask, you know, are these things that you actually want uh, agendized or just, uh, you know, perhaps in a a non-board meeting setting of just an update on the, the process or on the, the item. Um, and obviously welcome feedback as to this structure as well as certainly things to either add to this list or the idea is that as we come to this time in the meeting, um, you guys can collectively as a group or individually identify, hey, you know, 
looking back at this, I do recall the discussion around canine detective services, and I really do think it's something that we want to talk about in the next, you know, meeting or, you know, give give us, uh, and as Kevin and I have our agenda prep meeting in the week prior to, uh, to the meeting, uh, the actual <laughs> board meeting, that we can use this as well as our conversations around helping build the agenda for the future meetings. So here's my, my question about it. Um, so I look at the first one, which was, you know, my, I, you, I had heard about the professional learning communities. I wanted to hear more about it. It was exciting to me. Um, I could s easily say, you know, if you have anything to share, you know, send me an email. Or mm -hmm. if there's going to be a meeting, let me know. I'd love to attend. But at the same time, I'm, I'm very conscious of not wanting the administration to be about this is what I feel is happening at the city that bugs the heck out of me is that the staff is running around uh, for the purpose of the city council mm -hmm. instead of doing what the, I want you guys do you know if, if my needing an email about this is going to take you away from what your job is I don't I don't want to be interested in it I'd love you know I, I I'd love to know more, but I, I feel like asking each of us to sort of, I mean, what if is my concern that each of us has a different, you know, Shelly, it said mention Shelly the canine. So if, if you guys are being inundated with, you know, two things from me and one from, you know, where does that leave us in this world of we have one assistant superintendent, <laughs> you know, we don't have three. And we have, you know, Kathy, I, so that's my concern, is that I, although I have an interest and I've expressed an interest, um, if there's not a way to easily slide it into something that's already happening, I worry that it'll take too much of your time. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so, so there certainly is two different ways for this to be utilized. One is, Jane, as you're saying, it's totally appropriate to shoot me an email and I can work with our staff and the PLC case would be me and Cheryl working together on you saying, hey, I'd love to just get, you know, on your Friday update this coming week, uh, an update on PLC. If that's not something that must come in a public setting as a, you know, as an action item or, you know, something that can only be uh, me sharing information in this setting. And so uh, that's totally welcomed and, and appreciated and we can do that easily. Um, even if it is, you know, each person asking for their own update on something that they would love to just hear about again in our regular communications that we have via email. Um, I think that my idea with uh, trying to respond to what I was hearing from the board with creating this was really, again, not having it just be purely Kevin and I, and just for those in the audience uh, who don't know, uh, the board president and I meet on the Monday preceding the week of the board meeting. So that would be, you know, eight days ago. Um, and we invite one other board member to be present. Um, and so it's together us three that really build the agenda. And so this just gives you a reminder of things that you may want to encourage Kevin and that board member to, uh, to have on the agenda for an upcoming meeting and make sure that you, you don't end up saying something four times uh, in a meeting here and feel like it's not being you know, validated or heard as far as identifying it for a meeting you know, separate from just the email communication. I mean, I, I will say <laughs> I find this useful in the sense that there often there's a distinction between something I think that would typically end up in the parking lot and something where we specifically ask or a board member asks uh, the staff to do something specific, in which case you invariably do that thing and therefore it's not on the parking lot. But a perfect example is um, Member Ruff considered trying to have a team of trained dogs that would co just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Member Ruff considered uh, first responder, um, you know, some kind of act, you know, possibly as far as uh, in con context with uh, OI Day, doing some kind of you know recognition through the district. That's on me. I will tell you, I've I've talked to Johnny Johnson about it and. Did a little. Um, I know Shelly was a little skeptical about it, and so far she's proved right. But uh, but it's on me, and so so this is this will you know be there until I go. You know I I got nothing done, or or I have something that I think I can bring on it. Um, so for me, I, I find that helpful. I mean it, because it's it's sort of staring me in the face. It's on me, and at some point you know I might say yeah just take that off. 
uh, or not. Um, but but I think that there is a recognition that I'm, that something on the parking lot is not something that's been you know where we've asked you guys to do something, but instead where there's just sort of like an idea out there and we might want we might want to do something more with it. <coughs> Yeah. Do we get to put things on the parking lot? Or, <laughs> right? Anything you say is we definitely on the parking lot. For our parking area. Well, I have two things. Um, one, one of the things I strongly feel that the needs to do is publicize all the great things that we do. Uh, the Fourth of July is coming up, and the parade is happening. Uh, I think a lot of people come to Ojai with the idea that they want to be part of this parade. And then I see a lot of those people moving to Ojai right now. Um, and they have children. And I would love it if we could do some sort of formal, um, like last year, you know, the text <coughs> went back and forth between myself and a couple of other Topa people with, oh, Miramonte has a, they have a float? <gasps> My <laughs> exotes has a you know, so I would love to talk about that concept of publicizing what we do and how we go about doing that in a more formal way. I don't know if that's your job or not, but that's one concept. Um, the other thing that's floating around right now that came to my attention, I mean, it's, it's been, I've been thinking about it since an, a former board meeting, but uh, the concept of the absenteeism and that we, you know, we have, we need to, we need to publicize that and how it affects us. Um, and I was talking with Don Damianos today, and one of the things we were discussing was she was saying, you know, we're talking about Saturday school. <coughs> the things that the discussion went to was, you know, we have a lot of kids out in January, February, and I said, well, that's because they're all sick. I mean, I count on the February break specifically to break the cycle of children being. Six, 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 five. We got, right. it's, I count on that. I don't even necessarily personally like the February break, but I count on it to stop that cycle. And I don't know if that, again, I don't know if this is your conversation or not, but um, if we just had wash uh, hand washing stations outside where it wasn't one child at a time in the, in the cleaning their hands, but for five kids, <coughs> five gallon buckets, you know, they're, they're actually hand washing stations. Maybe we could work on breaking a cycle and increase our attendance during that, that time frame. So I'm just, I'm just, I don't know if it's a, an agenda item. I don't know if that's something you guys talk about or we just talk about amongst ourselves, but those were two ideas of, we need to, we need to do something about it. So it just so happens that um, the Ventura I, Board of Education, is that who it is? BCOE, thank you, um, holds dinners once a month, once a something. Mm -hmm. And their topic this time is on PR for school districts and how to get that word out. and. I'm really hoping that they have some valuable information that we can use because I totally agree mm -hmm. that we need to work on that. We're, we're, we need to compete. Yeah. Would you be interested in going? Can, can we? I I just signed up to go. Show me. Can are we limited to how many? All board members are invited. Could we like could a board member have a guest come? You're <coughs> more than welcome to bring a guest. I, per, I apparently will be still sick. April thirtieth. <laughs> Monday, April 30th. Yeah. We got it today. I got the Monday. Yeah. Whatever that Monday is. It's the 30th. Kathy. Anything else uh, about the. Anyone want to comment anything on the. Um, um, yeah, actually, um, and not because it's his idea, but um, the, the um, uh, first responders thing, I, I really think that. We had some exemplary performance. I, I'm not even necessarily saying the fire and the police because I'm having trouble getting past our own people who did heroic efforts. Um, and, and, and I really think that I'm, I'm uncomfortable not acknowledging, mm -hmm. frankly, 
I don't know how, but I, I, I really think we owe it. To have a party at Kevin's house for all. Of us. I'm okay. That works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're okay with that, right, Asa? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why she's here. <laughs> Make sure Stop nothing like that happens. Things, so. um, yeah. Also, I think we should continue to uh, work on that. And I do like this because I mean I'm I'm with Mike on you know this bilingual. It's like God, I would love that, but I know it costs money, and right. so it's kind of. Where do you go with it? Except, you know, unless, I don't know. Unless we write a grant. Maybe you and I go looking for grants or something. But then I go, oh, that's not my, you know, I'm stepping in. I'm, I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed <coughs> to do that. So, I don't think anybody's complain if you complain if you bring money. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting dynamic. So, yeah. But this is helpful to be re reminded. I agree. Yeah, and I will uh, say just uh, Shelly and I are listed as wanting to discuss the parcel tax. Uh, personally, on that subject right now, it doesn't feel like timing is right. No, it feels and it feels like we're kind of doing okay-ish. Plus, I think we need to spend more Measure J money before mm -hmm. we could do that. Mm -hmm. I would agree, and I think the discussion on what this property is going to look like has to happen first. Yeah. Would you uh, like that removed from this parking lot, or does it remain? Uh, but we just keep it there. You know what? Let's do the, fir the first time we've ever removed something. <laughs> All right. Are you good with that, Shelly? And that works for me. <laughs> Let's remove it. <laughs> we've done something. <laughs> That's so great. Um, All right. Are we ready for future agenda items? That's what this is. Is that what this yes. is? Yes. Okay, this isn't just parking lot? No. Um, I would like to know about the cell phone policies that we have, if we have, what they look like. I heard a, a program today about a... Um, a program called Away for the Day that's aimed at junior high kids where the policy is <laughs> your phone is gone during school hours and um, they say in the lockers I don't think we even have lockers for everybody at Matillaha so that wouldn't work but nonetheless there is a program available that has tools that you can use and other policies that other schools have used and feedback on how it's worked and I would really like to look into what we do currently and whether this would work for us or needs to happen. And just at the middle school, just at Matilda? This particular program is only for the middle school. Mm -hmm. I want to know what our policies are across the district. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm not sure to answer your question. <laughs> I think the discussion would be larger than just Matilda. It's, they're, you know, they're using them at school at the elementary school and at school at the high school. So yeah, you're right, it doesn't necessarily make sense just to look at middle school. The reasoning behind this particular program is that that's a very vulnerable time for kids and social media starts to take off and to kind of mitigate some of those consequences. You might find, and because I do know what the policies are, you might find that, that we, are, we already have policies, but... Well, how they're being implemented then maybe we will the question. either add that to a future agenda or I'll communicate out to the board and then see if there's follow-up for an actual agenda I said. Anyone else? I want to move to the consent calendar. Any questions? I only have one comment. <coughs> and that's... Um, I tried to do this much research as I could on the Costa Rica trip. Mm -hmm. I know you gave us that packet. It's rustic something. I don't remember now. Rustic. Uh, it's, I've got it right here. Pathways. Pathways. Thank you. Yes. And I just, I think it's a great trip. I have a little reservations on um, fall and tourism and, and the idea that we send teenagers to these countries to do these service projects when really their unskilled labor we're sending over there and unskilled labor in other countries is not really needed and a little issue with that. But it looks like this particular program does far more than just that service piece, that that service piece is kind of minor. Um, is there, but is there anything wrong? I mean, what would be the negative side of doing? There's a lot of information out there on how these programs really are more detrimental to countries than uh, beneficial. Um, that we would actually help 
these countries that we go to more by being tourists and spending money than than taking away potential um, you know if they're going to build a house or, or help build something we're sending unskilled labor to help build when the countries are often flooded with labor they just don't have money to spend on the laborers so you're kind of taking away jobs if you will by doing these service projects yeah i mean although assuming you wouldn't do it otherwise at least you're doing the thing right you're you're bringing down the but resources you down and you, know, you could do it better some, but you could, you could do, do it, it better. better but there's still not a and negative there is an argument that if you were just to spend money in that region you would be doing it better Right, but I mean, again, the point is, you could if you did nothing, you, you're certainly doing more than nothing, better than nothing. Uh, it's funny because Jem was in the group of the Presbyterian Church that went down to Mexico and mm -hmm. built some some houses, and um, and then I saw, you know, I don't know, I was on uh, Facebook and I saw a friend of mine up in in San Jose, a school district up there. There are big buses going down, you know, and it, it does make you wonder, you know, if it's if it's sort of becoming um, your term was volunteerism. It's an interesting idea, you know. I but that said, I, I, I still think, you know, they what they they didn't take anything out of the country. They came, brought stuff, built stuff, and yes, it's true that they might have used local labor in a more ideal world, but they left. I think them better off than they were when they when they went down there. But if our goal is is cultural awareness, you can do that without that. To be sure, you can do it more. You know, there's a which is why I'm not I'm not yeah. arguing this trip. I'm just <laughs> mentioning my level of of minor uncomfortableness. Yeah, I mean, you could do that here for Habitat for Humanity without going could. to another country. You could. I, I haven't really fully thought it through, although I, I think, I think uh, I've thought it through enough to know that all the kids went down, got paid nothing, worked their butts off, <laughs> and left uh, Happy. a uh, orphanage with houses that they didn't have before they went down there. And overall, I, I don't think anyone went out there with a, with a bad... Uh, more research on it. Yeah, but that said, the people that did it are certainly entitled to the kudos for doing it. Right, but some of the problems are specifically with <clears throat> orphanages and with building for orphanages because rather than helping the infrastructure on not having orphanages, it actually encourages more parents to not be able to care for their kids because they're getting... There's, I, I'll stop now, but I, my son, <laughs> Joseph was the one that, that was like, you know, because he researched all of this because he was looking to go and do something like that. And, um, found out that, that a lot of times we do more harm than we realize. So I'll stop there. So I'll move to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So the question at this time is do we return to a closed session or do we call it anything? I think I'm good to call it an evening. I, I feel like we... I feel I got clear guidance from you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, use that? Oh, yeah, yeah well, I want to use it. <laughs> so, Asla, when I was in Turkey, I bought something, and then they gave me this oh, free packet of Turkish spices. I don't know spices. what he felt. And so I thought I, I brought them for you because I don't <laughs> but know I was like, I'm going to try to remember to send him a note. You what? But I thought it was, I thought it was great. Yeah,